Uh, welcome to uh, everybody. Um, we are moving uh, right now to the uh, last session of the day, uh, which is the PhD session. So um, uh, we have uh, we will have eight presentations from PhD uh, of different labs. Uh, I will just uh, recall that the announcement of the award will be on Friday uh, noon. Uh, I will also just present you briefly the jury that will attribute the award. So the jury will be composed by uh, Donata Yandolo uh, from Lab Symbiose, uh, by Riyad Lakmi. Uh, maybe you can switch on your camera. Can you see me, Florence? Yes, perfect. Can you see me? Okay. So Riyad is from Laboratoire. Tori LGF, uh, Laboratoire Georges Friedel in Ecole des Mines uh, Saint Etienne, and uh, <laughs> the jury is composed by Jeremy Rouxel. Uh, Jeremy, can you switch on your camera, please? Hi, nice to meet you, Paul. And uh, Jeremy is uh, from Lab Huberturien, a new member uh, of Lab Huberturien. Um, so just uh, before starting, I want to recall you all uh, PhD students and PhD that uh, you have a 20 minute time slot. That means that the presentation should be around 15 and 18 minutes and not exceed 18 minutes so that we will have time for a few questions and then um, we will be in time at the end of the day. So I let the floor to Donata. For yeah. the... Yes. Uh, so okay. Um, welcome back, uh, everyone. So um, it is my pleasure uh, to introduce Maria Alejandra Osugai Guita. I hope that I pronounce it correctly from the laboratory of uh, and she will give us a presentation, as you can read from the slide, on uh, micro uh, nanostructure thin. Um, Ah, uh, thin films from uh, nitridation of a photoparticle um, titanium oxide soil gel uh, coating. Uh, and I leave you the, the floor. Thanks so much. So, good afternoon. I am Maria Usuga. Today, I will take you about micro and nanostructural titanium nitride films for nitridation of a photopartable titanium, titanium dioxide soil gel coating. This work was carried out with the collaboration of Arnaud Nicolas crespo monteron Damien Jamon, Michel Langlais, Francis Vaucanson, and Yves Jorlin within the Uber Korean Laboratory. So, this presentation will take a place of and objectives, uh, the analysis of titanium dioxide sodium layer, the characterization of nitride layer, the structuration of titanium dioxide sodium layer, the nitridation of the structure of titanium dioxide layer, and finally a conclusion. The titanium nitride is a metallic material with a fixed central cube structure. Uh, it has a yellow appearance like a golden. It has a plasmonic properties, a high temperature and a high melting point. So it is interesting for high temperature sensor application and in several conditions. The titanium nitride is highly reflected in the infrared range. Um, like a gold, uh, the titanium nitride can replace the gold under certain conditions, particularly in several conditions where the gold can meet or dissolve. This material has also a good wear resistance. Uh, sometimes it is used as protective coating exposed to wear and it has a good electrical properties. But how can titanium nitride be, be obtained? The titanium nitride can be obtained using the chemical vapor deposition and the physical vapor deposition. There are the techniques the most used to obtain titanium nitride. But uh, if we want to do a microstructuration of the layer, it's so difficult to, uh, or to uh, it's hard. But what is the interesting of micro nanostructure titanium nitride? The titanium nitride microstructure is used in plasmonic application. The plasmonics is at the heart of many aspects of nano optics and photonics. 
Uh, it is used of a broad variety of research and commercial applications. Some advantages of the titan titanium nitride micro nanostructural um, films are a uh, good ladder light matter interaction, uh, good trapping light, uh, light filtering, uh, good decomposition of lime, and uh, the titanium nitride has the same plasmonic properties of the gold. Uh, it can replace the gold in some uh, applications. Mm, for the realization of micro and nanostructural surfaces, some authors web have obtained titanium nitride microstructures. Um, for example, for realization of uh, nano antennas, the bottom up technique uh, was employed. It was necessary to realize a lot, a lot of uh, deposition of the sacrificial layer and aging process. Another example to realize the plasmonic biosensor, which meets the titanium nitride rating, the author realized a, a mode of uh, this mold uh, was filed uh, by titanium nitride using the atomic layer deposition and an action process uh, was uh, necessary to suppress the silica mold. So using these techniques to obtain uh, titanium nitride surfaces in micro nanostructures, uh, these methods are difficult to implement because there, there are multiple uh, multiple action process and um, there are time consuming. So it exists another method to, go, to obtain titanium nitride macro and nanostructures. This method is the ammonolysis of titanium dioxide or gel to obtain titanium nitride micro and nanostructures. But what is the ammonolysis process? The ammonolysis process is uh, the reaction of temperature. To obtain titanium nitride, some reaction will be carried out with the between the ammonia gas and the titanium dioxide at high temperature. It was demonstrated that it is possible to obtain uh, titanium nitride grating using the ammonolysis process. Some authors uh, have uh, realized a uh, titanium dioxide grating using a soldier using the classic ammonia method, uh, we have obtained a titanium nitride grating uh, conserving the same structure. The problem of the classic ammonolysis method, it is uh, the high, uh, use a high temperature at a long heating time. So an innovative method is proposed to obtain titanium nitride micro and nanostructures. This method is the ammonolysis of titanium dioxide soldier layer with the rapid thermal annual ammonolysis process. The RTA nitridation consists to heat with some infrared flash emitted plants. Um, the infrared flame flash, sorry, the infrared flash is applied during few seconds and during a lot, a lot of cycles. The ammonia gas reacts with the, the titanium dioxide to produce titanium nitride. Some advant advantage of this technique compared with the traditional nitridation technique are uh, this method is quick and easy to implement. Uh, it uses a short health in time and it, it, uh, it has a less stringent condition. Our, con our objective during this presentation is the demonstration of the transformation of titanium dioxide layer in, an, in a titanium natural layer using the RTA ammonolysis. At, at first, we want to transform uh, a titanium dioxide base soil layer in a titanium natural layer using the RTA ammonolysis without any micro microstructural process. Uh, at first, we want to test this technique. Uh, we want to deposit the surgical layer using the steam coating method. We do the RTA nitridation process at following of the characterization of layer. If we obtain titanium nitride, the process is validated and the realization of micro nanostructures will be carried out. 
To realize the micro nanostructures, it is necessary to employ uh, the photosensitive properties of soil gel. To obtain a photopatternable soil gel, it is necessary to mix uh, like uh, some solvents like uh, methanol, butanol, water, and uh, chlorhydric acid as catalyzer, a metal precursor, titanium isopropoxide, and a complex agent, benzoyl acetone. Uh, the titanium isopropoxide and benzoyl acetone is forms a complex agent which is photosensitive to the UV light. This photopatternable soil gel is compatible with several lithography techniques. Um, using the photosensitive property of soil gel and the different lithography techniques, we want to obtain titanium dioxide micro nanostructures. Using the ERTA nitridation, we, we want to transform the titanium dioxide micro nanostructures into titanium nitride micro nanostructures um, using a sample lithography and nitridation method without the uh, deposition of sacrificial layer or extra process. At first, we do the characterization of the nitride layer without, without any microstructuration. Uh, for the X-ray uh, diffraction, uh, the titanium dioxide does not show this. Uh, it is mean that the, the titanium dioxide it is amorphous. When we do the nitridation process, we can see that the characteristic peaks of the titanium nitride appear. Using the Raman spectroscopy, Copy technique, uh, we can see that the titanium dioxide Raman spectra shows some vibration modes of the organic complex benzoyl titanium, titanium isopropoxide benzoyl acetone. When we realize the nitridation process, the characteristic spectra of titanium nitride appears after nitridation. Uh, using a more advanced characterization technique, the high resolution transmission electron microscope, microscopy, we can see that nitridation a quantity of titanium and oxygen is present in the sample. When we do the nitridation process, uh, we obtain a titanium nitride layer uh, with a uh, quantity of titanium is also pre uh, present. Uh, the oxygen uh, concentration is insignificant and the con uh, nitrogen concentration increase, increases. When we compare with before and after nitridation, we can see that the uh, uh, quantity of nitrogen uh, atoms is, uh, is present after nitridation process. Uh, for the optical properties, uh, the reflect the reflectance and the layer, the titanium nitride layer is highly reflective, near to seventy percent in the infrared range, and uh, the to the ref refractive index, we can see that it exists a change of the refractive index before and after nitridation. After nitridation, uh, we can compare the refractive index with the um, values finding in the literature. We can see that it exists a little difference between the, these uh, values finding in the literature. Uh, it is uh, due to the high porosity in the layer. Also, we can see that the titanium thickness uh, it is 300 nanometers. And after nitridation, the titanium nitride thickness it is 50 nanometers. So a high densification of the layer was carried out. And from the permittivity of the titanium nitride, in our film, uh, the very value of the permittivity is closer for one of the titanium nitride bulk described in the literature. This little difference is also attributed to the porosity of the layer. See also that uh, the layer is a good material for the plasmonic wave propagation. Uh, from the electrical and mechanical properties, uh, from the electrical 
differences, uh, we can see that for the titanium dioxide, if we compare with the titanium dioxide uh, finding found in the literature, uh, this difference in these values uh, it comes uh, it is attributed to the because the titanium dioxide actually it constitutes a zero gel, and the titanium nitride layer has a high conductivity. So uh, we can say that it has a metallic behavior. From the nano harness, uh, we can see that before and after methylation, uh, the harness increase after methylation with the RTA and analysis process. And uh, no modification of the sulfur harness after methylation process. Uh, uh, so we obtain a titanium nitride layer after methylation process with RTA process. Uh, so we can say that the methylation process was, was validated. So the next step is the RTA methylation process from titanium dioxide micro nanostructure layer using the photosensitive property of titanium dioxide so gel. Uh, when we realize the, the irtian methylation on the micro nanostructures, we want to obtain titanium nitride micro nanostructures. So, um, uh, it, how it does work the photosensitive soil gel? Using the photolithography method, at first we use, we use, we do, we realize the deposition of soil gel using a spin of deep coating. We, a thermal treatment at low temperature was made to keep the photosensitive behavior of the soil gel. When we realized the UV illumination, uh, it, it, uh, uh, it exists a transformation of this complex titanium isopropoxide benzoyl acetone with, uh, into a species which are insoluble in ethanol. Um, we realize different methods of lithography, and when we develop in ethanol, uh, the known insulated zones are removed. Using this whole gel, uh, the different lithography methods, we can fabricate micro structures such as logos and gratings, and nanostructures such as nanopillars. So for the nitridation, the micro nanostructure films, uh, this nitridation was realized using the RTA monolysis was uh, described previously, uh, using the RTA nitridation. Um, it is a, it was a, it is demonstrated that it's an easy technique to realize titanium nitride micro nanostructures using a photopatternable soil gel and uh, rapid thermal analysis, analysis process. And the conclusion of this work it is the a photopatternable titanium dioxide soil gel was used to print in grating. The nitridation of titanium dioxide layer with the rapid thermal analysis process was established. The characterization of layer shows a transformation of titanium dioxide into a nitride layer. The micro nanostructure layer titanium nitride were obtained using the photosensitive behavior of titanium dioxide gel and then nitride using the RTN process. Some perspective of this work it is the study of the stability of titanium nitride over the time. Obtained titanium nitride of substrate with, uh, with uh, variable geometry, like cylinders, for example and decrease the porosity of the layer, and increase the titanium nitride thickness layer. And thanks for your attention. Uh, thank you, Maria Alejandra. Sorry, I forgot to uh, remind the speakers to um, uh, open their, um, to activate their camera. Uh, so, uh, if anyone has uh, questions, um, you can either write it in the, in the chat or uh, we have uh, one minute. Um, hi, I have one question. Yes, please. Um, I, I would like to know, uh, th thank you for the presentation. Uh, I was wondering what is the impact of the intensity of the IR light you, you, you use during the annealing step? Because I guess you, 
exchange a different amount of heat if you increase intensity? The intensity of the, sorry, are you of, asking? Of the, of the light you use in the, I mean, if I understand well, for the RTA uh, step, you use oh. a, a, an IR light, right? Yeah, but it depends on the, um, sometimes it, it depends on the, for example, for, um, percent of the quantity of light. Using this method, we use a 30% of the, of, uh, of power of uh, the, from the um, illumination using the flash. But the intensity, the, I don't know exactly. We use only a power and uh, a time uh, of uh, illumination, but not especially uh, uh, intensity. Uh, so, so modify the, the amount of energy you transfer, you modify the time rather than the power of the light. Yeah, the time and the number of cycles. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Jeremy. Um, any other uh, questions? Yes, I have a small question. Thank yes, you. please. Yes. Uh, you said in uh, slide number nine that uh, you uh, you had a TiO2 uh, that was amorphous and uh, uh, thanks to uh, RTA, yes. uh, it becomes cr cr crystalline. And you, you said in the in the slide just after that uh, uh, subsequently to this step you had a kind of I, I don't know if I understood well but you have a densification you had a porous layer uh, could, you, could you explain this yes uh, when we do the titanium dioxide we realize only a thermal treatment a low temperature uh, one hundred ten degrees. Uh, in this, uh, using this temperature, the titanium dioxide is not crystalline. It's amorphous. Uh, when we realize, for example, a thermal twin and a 500 nanometer, we can see that the titanium dioxide, it is in the anatas phase. In this case, uh, we, we have uh, realized a low thermal, low temperature thermal treatment. The peaks, uh, the titanium dioxide is amorphous because using this uh, low temperature of thermal training, we can keep the photosensitive behavior of the soil gel. So we want to use the same uh, sequences to realize the titanium dioxide non-structural layers and titanium dioxide structural layers. And for the structural layer, it is necessary a low temperature of thermal training. Okay, and uh, and do you have an idea of the temperature that is reached subsequent uh, during your RTA treatment? No, the to, temperature to... is not possible to know the temperature because uh, when we realize the RTA poses, uh, is uh, only uh, the program shows only the the number of cycles and the person of the lamp. But the okay. temperature is not possible. It's not controlled. It's not no. measured. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Alejandra, for your um, answers and like um, for the question to the to the people that asked question. Uh, we will be moving now to uh, the following speaker, who is Julie Dutemp. Yes. Hello. Hi. Um, Alejandra, could you uh, stop sharing, so, please? So, okay. Thank you. So, uh, while you uh, upload your presentation, I will briefly introduce you. Uh, so, um, uh, you are also from the laboratory uh, Uber Curia, um, working uh, more or less in the same team I gather uh, from the, from the uh, co-authors. Uh, and the title of your presentation is going to be uh, theme passing film characterization by sur surface plasma uh, resonance. And the floor is yours. Okay. So, uh, hello everybody. My name is Julie Dutan, and I, uh, I'm going to present to you uh, my PhD entitled Thin Passive Film Characterization by Surface Plasma Resonance. This uh, thesis is in collaboration with the Laboratoire Hubert Curien in Saint Etienne. 
Laboratoire Matéis in Lyon and uh, HCF Iréis uh, in uh, Andrézieux. During this presentation, I, I am going to introduce my subject by talking about passive films and the surface plasma resonance. I'll then continue by uh, talking about the detection of interface modification by uh, surface plasma resonance. I'll present to you the experimental setup and some results and finish uh, this presentation by a small conclusion about the perspective uh, of the project. So first, what are passive films? Passive film is a thin layer of a complex oxide that uh, can appear naturally at uh, the surface of a, of a passive metal. This uh, complex oxide layer aims to protect the passive metal against uh, corrosion against its, against its environment. Uh, this film is extremely thin and uh, is composed of an inner layer of uh, dense oxide and an outer layer of an uh, hydrated oxide. You can characterize this passive film by uh, electrochemistry uh, and mostly by uh, electrochemical impedance spectroscopy. It permits to uh, give the passive material behavior, uh, the resistivity of this passive film, and uh, with, the, um, with the, the effective permittivity of the entire film and uh, the thickness of the entire film, it is possible to uh, obtain the capacity of this film. In electrochemistry, in order to, uh, to characterize the electrochemical interface, uh, the concept of capacity is very important since it is possible to uh, model this uh, interface by a succession of different capacities. All of that are crucial information about film's quality and material robustness against corrosion. The idea behind my project is to use an optical characterization called the surface plasma resonance to characterize uh, this passive film. Surface plasma is very sensitive to permitty and thickness variation. And uh, this combined techniques, of, well, the surface plas this technique, uh, surface plasma resonance, aims to be a complementary characterization technique for passive films, for uh, just to, um, to help to decorrelate, to, uh, to, add, um, to add more information about this passive film. Just for example, to have the permittivity of the inner uh, layer of oxide or the, uh, the outer layer of hydroxide. What is the surface plasma resonance? It is defined as uh, the collective oscillation of electrons at the metal and dielectric interface. It can be seen as an evanescent wave that will uh, propagate at the interface of the dielectric and the metal and that will scan the interface. It is very sensitive to an interface variation such as the permittivity and the film thickness. Um, it is, uh, it's a uh, propagation constant is, uh, depends on uh, the, the light wave vector, the real part of the permittivity of the metal and, uh, the permittivity of the dielectric. Um, in order for the plasma to exist, the real part of the permittivity of the metal should be negative and the absolute value of the real part of the permittivity of the metal should be greater than that of uh, the, the, the permittivity of the dielectric. If you have a, a metal, uh, just for example, in the air, and uh, you put a light incident on this metal, you will not have a surface plasma because the electrons that are in the metal and the, the dielectric do not oscillate in phase. So to achieve that, for, for the electrons to, to have this collective oscillation and for the plasma to exist, uh, phase matching must be guaranteed between the oscillation of electrons in the metal and the dielectric. To achieve that, we can use a prism or a micro and nano structured surface. What is the difference between both? Uh, is that for the prism, uh, you need to use uh, for the light um, incident on the prism to, uh, to go through the metal, uh, it must be optically transparent. And so in my thesis, since uh, I am studying uh, passive film, it means that there are an oxidation of the metal, which means metal will be consumed. So if I have something, uh, if I have um, metal that is really thin, uh, there's a chance, there's a huge chance that the entire metal will be consumed. So that is the reason why uh, we are using a diffraction grating. Uh, it is possible to use a bulk metal in this uh, coupling method. The thing is, uh, its realization is complex. So what happens uh, with the diffractive grating uh, and the surface plasma? An incident light, uh, a light will be incident on our grating 
and some energy from the incident slides will be used uh, by the plasmon, uh, well, for the plasmon to propagate. And the reflected light will be uh, observed in the case of the white lights by a spectrophotometer, uh, giving uh, what is called here a plasmoning dip. And uh, we will observe uh, the, the light minus uh, the wavelength associated with the energy that has been used by the plasmon to propagate at the interface. Uh, the wavelength is called the resonance wavelength and depends on the parameters or, of our grating and um, the material used, the metal, the dielectric used. SPR is a good sensitive technique for sensing devices such as gas detection and mostly biosensors. Uh, it is a well-defined in literature uh, nowadays. So, uh, how with the surface plasmon we will detect an interface uh, modification by a coupled measurement by plasmon and electrochemistry. So, as I told you in this thesis, I'm using diffractive grating, um, a structured substrate with a sputter deposited a pure aluminium that will be dipped in an electrolyte. The a white light will be incident on our grating. The surface plasmon will propagate at the interface and the spectrophotometer will, ob will observe the surface plasmon. And when we will have a modification at the interface, hence the growth of a passive film, there will be, there will be a modification into uh, the resonance wavelength. And that is this variation that, um, that will be used uh, in order to, uh, to, to know uh, what, what, what modification has been done at the interface. And so uh, the more, for example, the a film uh, will grow, a passive film will grow, the more we will observe a variation uh, in the spectrum uh, observed by the spectrophotometer. Uh, to do so, we have an experimental setup. So uh, here we have uh, an electrochemical cell that will contain the diffractive grating, some electrodes linked to a potential stat. We retrieve our white light and uh, the spectrophotometer here. Um, the potential stats in uh, this experimental setup will control the spectrophotometer in order to have synchronized electrochemical and uh, optical data. And uh, the potential stats will, um, will change, uh, will induce a variation into the potential applied in, uh, on, our, um, on our samples, uh, which means that there will be a modification in the interface. And then uh, again, we can uh, take all the data and uh, follow uh, the modification of this interface. Here is a picture of uh, the actual, ac the actual uh, experimental setup here um, with the electrochemical cell, the, the, the electrodes. Uh, here is the spectrophotometer, the incident light, etc. So here are some uh, results. Um, in blue, you find uh, the, um, in blue are the, um, the uh, electrochemical data. So each dot corresponds to a new potential that has been applied on, um, on our samples. Um, the, um, the orange curves corresponds to uh, the optical data and uh, one point corresponds to the, va um, the variation into the wavelength resonance between the first spectrum that has been done at the beginning of the process and the last spectrum uh, under the, sorry, uh, the spectrum corresponds to um, the one acquired during this, during uh, while this potential has been applied. Uh, we were able to achieve uh, uh, this resolution uh, because um, we did some uh, mathemat, uh, we did some fitting on our curves. So for each spectra that has been acquired, we have reversed them and uh, make a third order Gaussian fit in order to have a um, in order to to have a um, a, mathem um, a mathematic uh, equation. And uh, hence, in that case, it is uh, possible to retrieve the wave uh, the resonance wavelengths uh, with a huge precision. So what's uh, happening on this curve? Uh, with this low potential, we are in what we call the cathodic domains, which means that uh, we had a species reduction. Yes, um, the 
my uh, metallic samples, my aluminium samples, when they were in the air, they uh, a passive film naturally uh, naturally appeared uh, to protect it from uh, from the excision, and um, and then uh, with those potentials, uh, the th this uh, this passive film has been uh, reduced. And it is possible to uh, to observe it thanks to surface plasmon resonance. If you see it with just this uh, with just this uh, little um, this little variation, and uh, starting this point, we are in the anodic domain, which means there are species species oxidation with a higher potential applied. And so uh, during uh, during this um, this spot. A uh, new passive film has been um, has been forced to uh, to growth thanks to electrochemistry. The thing is, right now we don't really know the specificity of uh, the passive film. We don't really know what really happened uh, during this interface modification. We don't really know, for example, uh, the thickness of uh, the um, the hydroxide, or uh, if it's just a pure oxide that has appeared, for example. We don't really know. So. Uh, to achieve that, uh, that is the next step into uh, this thesis. It is to do an interface study of uh, bulk aluminium. We want to have uh, a different interface configuration um, to just to know uh, what happened. So to achieve that, we will apply. We will uh, we'll do the same measurements, but with a different electrolyte concentration and modify the pH, and then. We will uh, characterize it thanks to polarization curves and uh, electrochemical electrochemical impedance spectroscopy. In the same time, we will uh, start. Uh, we will um, we will create a standard model for plasmon for uh, aluminium um, oxide by uh, deposits on a flat metallized substrate, different uh, thickness of aluminium oxide. And uh, do some uh, ellipsometric measurements in order to uh, to know um, to know more about uh, those, uh, about the, the, the pure oxide layer, and then uh, deposit the same layer on uh, our structured sample in order to create a calibration of uh, for our optical measurements to know what uh, what pure aluminium uh, what pure ox aluminium oxide will. Um, We'll do uh, we'll do on our surface plasmon resonance uh, by combining uh, both. Um, we will try to do, uh, we will uh, achieve to do an, an interface study of a structured uh, sample with uh, aluminium coating. We will using the same parameters of as for bulk metal in order to have an interface comparison. Indeed, uh, we don't really know yet if um, the the electrochemical behavior of bulk aluminium. And uh, my sample with the, the aluminium coating have the same electrochemical behavior, so it'll be interesting to uh, to have uh, this interface com uh, comparison to know if this um, this method is uh, well suited for for bulk. And then um, we we'll, we will do uh, the optical measurements in uh, those um, with those different interface. In, a, in order to have a comparison, just uh, for example, uh, how will the plasmon be behave when uh, there's, uh, for example, a lot of uh, hydro hydroxide and uh, just a little bit of, uh, of oxide layer. And uh, when uh, all of this will be achieved, we, uh, we will create a mathematical model to make a link between the optical and the electrochemical measurements. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, and thank you for staying uh, in the in the in the time. Uh, so, um, are there any any questions for uh, Julie? You can write them in the chat if you if you want, or you can just raise your hand and unmute yourself. Uh, I had a quick question, uh, not really in the in the field, uh, but on uh, slide seven, when you were comparing the two um, the two curves, uh, there was a difference between the potential at which you have, like, so you were, yeah, um, if you look at the polarization, the plasmonic shift, 
I, I was I was thinking, and I I really look at these curves. I mean, with very a very naive approach, but I would have thought of having you know the same potential at which uh, you have the the switch or the change in behavior. Let's say. I'm not sure I got your question. I'm not sure I understood your question. So, so I'm sorry. Uh, so maybe I didn't. So I, I thought that the plasmonic shift, um, uh, so the plasmonic shift is, uh, so how do you run the measurement? So maybe this could, uh, clarify my question. Are the measurement done in a similar way in the sense that I mean, like you change the potential and you acquire the, uh, the current and the, uh, so so what happens is that uh, the potential stat will apply uh, um, a potential on uh, the um, on my symbol. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I will acquire uh, the optical data, and the potential stat will uh, measure uh, the current density on uh, on my sample. So the, the 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 potential is the same for every and each time point. Yes, no, it's not a time point. Uh, this is potential uh, here is actually here. It's uh, at. Uh, time uh, zero seconds mm -hmm. and this is time uh end uh, end of the the measurements so, and they so. correspond so yeah yeah i was just wondering i mean like why there is not um as you uh, explained the, the first part of the plus the change in the plasmonic shift as uh, an explanation for this um for what you see this in uh in the position i was just wondering why there is not a, a correspondence in the potential but oh um Actually, um, just uh, I, I can't really. Uh, I know. Uh, sorry. So mm -hmm. I know why there, there's a change uh, here, but we don't really know yet what's really happening at the interface. And uh, those are measurements that uh, I am currently doing uh, just to know what exactly ha is happening. Because yes, I, I, I can uh, see your confusion about the fact that. I go down and then uh, go up we, uh, while staying in the same domain. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, that's, that's your confusion. Exactly. Okay, <laughs> I can see your confusion. Yes, um, the thing is, um, when I first well, when you put your sample into uh, the electrolytes, you wait for a few hours for the potential to to have a kind of an uh, elect uh, thermodynamic uh, equilib uh, equilibrium. Yeah, equilibrium. So, yeah. Yes. Yes. And uh, then you start to apply the different potentials. Uh, the thing is, uh, the potential may have um, an influence on. Um, th th that is why we don't really have uh, the same value here and here. It may uh, it may induce other changes. So uh, that is the reason why we need to uh, to do a electrochemical impedance spectroscopy, just for example, at this potential to know what's really happening at this potential. So I don't know. Thank you very much for the for the experience. Thank you. Uh, is there any other question from the from the audience? I, I have a small question if if we have time. Yes, sure. Yes. Um, so I'm not from uh, the domain too, so uh, maybe the, the, this question will will be uh, a, a little bit simple for you. But uh, I was interesting uh, in, in it. So you 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 observe uh, a resonance in uh, in, uh, in uh, corresponding to the, to the interface of uh, the uh, metal and uh, the passive layer interface. And uh, how do you physically explain the, the presence of this uh, of this resonance at? Uh, at the frequent, uh, frequency or wavelength re resonance. Oh, uh, why can we observe a resonance? Wh wh what? Is, how do you explain it physically? Physically, how? Um, physically, it's uh, energy of. Um, uh, the, the physical explanation of the presence of this uh, resonance. Uh, it's that uh, wavelength can be associated with the energy, and uh, in order for the plasma to exist, energy at one specific wave, uh, uh, energy associated at one specifically wavelength at one resonance is used for the plasma to propagate. Uh, I don't know if it's it, if if it was the question. Uh, 
Actually, uh, I have another question, maybe the... For, uh, for... Yes, a quick one, because we are... Ah. <laughs> yes, please, go ahead. Yes. Um, so you, you wanted to correlate the, 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 the frequency shift to the thickness of the, the passive layer form? Mm -hmm. so, um, you, you use the, the, the system uh, aluminium alumina? Mm -hmm. So, and and uh, how can you uh, are you have you checked in the in the literature that this system was uh, was um, um, reliant with the the the, the plasmonic formation? Uh, with uh, well, um, by studying the the shift in the resonance wavelengths. It is uh, linked uh, in uh, all the equation, uh, all the plasmonic equation uh, to uh, the growth of um, of a film. It, it can be it can be linked to the growth of a film, and uh, we do have a um, um, a software with a calculus code based on a Shandizen, uh, uh, Shandizen equation, uh, where it is popular. Uh, where it is possible to simulate uh, the growth of something, for, uh, to simulate uh, the response of uh, our greetings, and uh, hence uh, the growth, for example, of uh, of alumina. But the thing is, it's not in that case uh, pure alumina. It's uh, it is composed of alumina, but it's composed of uh, hydrated uh, aluminium oxide. So I don't know if it answers your question. Yes. So you're confident in in the fact that you you you, you will be able to link. Uh, thickness and uh, and uh, the shift of your resonance frequency. Oh yes, yes, yes. It's uh, it's already well established uh, since ah, okay. uh, since um, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, that's what my opinion. Okay. So this platform, uh, yes, it, 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 yes. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. For, thank you very much uh, for the questions and for the answer. And I'm sorry we have to uh, move to the following speaker. Who oh, is yes, Hugo Bria? Oui. Yes, I'm uh, here. Uh, yeah, Julie, if you uh, want, you can. There is a question for you in the chat, and if you want, you can uh, reply to this, the question in the in the chat. Yes, but uh, maybe uh, it it may interest other people. I'll do another presentation on Friday morning during uh, the third axis workshop, uh, a more detailed presentation about this project. So, okay, thank you. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, so, um, uh, Hugo is yes. from the laboratory Berkeley, and he will give us a presentation of optical sensors for the monitoring of uh, air quality. Um, and the floor is yours. Um, and you, yeah, uh, yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Hello to everyone. I will talk about my PhD project which consists of the development of an optical sensor for the monitoring of air quality with a focus on two gases, nitrate dioxide and ozone. It's uh, nana funded. Uh, reply to this, the question in the, in the chat. Yes, but uh, maybe uh, it's, it may interest other people. I'll do another presentation on Friday morning during uh, the third axis workshop, uh, a more detailed presentation about this project. So, Okay, thank you. Yes. Uh, so, um, uh, Hugo is yes. uh, from the laboratory Berkeley, and he will give us a presentation of optical sensors for the monitoring of uh, air quality. Um, and the floor is yours. Um, and you, yeah, uh, yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Hello to everyone. I will talk about my PhD project which consists of the development of an optical sensor for the monitoring of air quality with a focus on two gases, nitrate dioxide and ozone. It's an INF funded project in collaboration with Institut Pascal of Clermont-Ferrand, uh, SILCEF from Archand and ANVEA uh, from Poissy. So for the outline of my presentation, first I will talk about uh, about the subject of the project, why we will be why we are interested about these two gases. Uh, 
After this, a presentation very quickly of diffraction gratings and plasmonics, which bring us to the optical effect that I'm using during my thesis, the optical switching effect, and then an experimental results on the sensing application of the switching effect before the conclusion. So, the project, the goal of the project is to sense polyene gases, so nitride dioxide and ozone with a plasmonic effect. For these two gases, we will work with two functionalized layers, two different functional layers. So the cup of in layer for the nitride dioxide and indigo layer for ozone. Uh, so here it's uh, a scheme of the of the goal of the project. So an optical transistor, transducer, sorry, made by gold grating with a functionalized layer, and then an optical source with two detectors permits us to measure the gas quantity in this cell. So why do we work with these polyons in particular? So the nitrogen dioxide, it's a poison for human, for the humans, and it is produced by human activities. And also it can be a precursor for ozone nitrates, which can create acid waves. And the ozone, it's also a poison by, for the humans. For example, at 0.2 ppm, we can have some effects, uh, some difficulties to breathe. And at 9 ppm, which is very little, we can have pulmonary, pulmonary edema. Uh, and also the link between these two gases, it's that at high atmosphere, ozone uh, can be produced by the interaction of nitrate dioxide and the solar waves. An introduction of diffraction grating. So here we can, you can see a photography of a diffraction grating, of a deep diffraction grating. So the effect of a diffraction grating is that for an incident light, we have the classical reflected and refracted light. Uh, so we call it the fundamental reflected and transmitted orders. And also for different angular position, we can have light uh, in different modes for minus the minus the first diffracted order in reflection. And also we can have it in here, transmission. Here we can have a, uh, an illustration of the effect of the period and of the incident angle of the diffraction gratings. For a diffraction grating, we have some parameters like the wavelength of the light, the period of the grating, the depth of the grating, the angle of incidence, and the refractive indices of the different medium. And we can, with this, plot, compute the uh, direction of diffraction for each other with two equations, the equation of gratings in reflection and in transmission. This equation can be found by uh, an optical, a geometrical, sorry, construction in reciprocal phase, space in Everald's sphere. But this equation doesn't give us any information in the intensity in each other. So for this, we have to take into account the shape of the grading and make some electromagnetic simulation. How here do we fabricate for this project our gratings? The first gratings, the, we call it master gratings, were produced by little interference, laser interference lithography process with two coherent UV beam, which produce an interference pattern, sinusoidal interference pattern on a photoresist layer. And then with the developer, we can have this kind of shape on a diffraction gradient. And then with our partner SILSEF, we send these gratings to them because the lead process is not very uh, it's complicated to have with each experiment exactly the same parameters. So we send to them the 
resin the master grating and they make some mold of the gratings and by new method they emboss an ammonia salt gel layer with the mold and then we can have a uh, industrial production of all this grading with a very very low differences between each replication so the now a presentation of the pasmonics we we have a presentation by julie also another presentation so surface plasmon is there are evanescent waves at the dielectric metal interface, interface, sorry, for TM polarization of light. So, uh, plasmon waves are like couple modes, are uh, modes of the light, and they are defined by the light wave vector and the real part of the metal permittivity and the dielectric permittivity. Uh, these waves can only exist if these two conditions are verified, and these two conditions are verified only with a metal dielectric interface. We can't have this kind of conditions verified in the other kind of interface. We have mainly two waves for plasma coupling, an angular interrogation with a prism in total reflection uh, setup, and the evanescent field at the interface of the of the prison can be coupled to a plasma mold. And also with gratings, we can have classically regulating its wavelength interrogation, and then with an incident spectrum, a wide incident spectrum, incident of the grating, the output will be all the spectrum without energy in the wavelength of resonance. An example of grating coupling, of a uh, simulation of a grating coupling. So here we have the efficiency of the fundamental diffracted order. And we can see at here a plasmonic dip with, uh, so these are the parameter of a grating, a gold grating at TM polarization. And here it's an approximate formula to have an approximation of the resonance wavelengths and to feel the sensing effect of this of this mounting, we have here quantities related to the optical properties of the dielectric medium. So by changing the refractive index index of the dielectric medium, we change these quantities, and so we change the position of resonance, and we can shift the resonance. These are classical mounting for and classical setup for diffraction for grating coupling as really present, but we will talk about a tiny different coupling, which is the optical switching effect. We here typical curve of optical switching effect. We call it optical switching effect because we have a switch of energy between two diffractive orders by changing the angle of incidence. We have at low angle, at 10 degree, we have all the energy in the minus, in the fundamental order. At 26 degree, we have all the energy in the minus first order. And at 46 degree, we have also all the energy coming back in the fundamental order. So with, it's a plasmon effect that is only happen with TM polarization. And what we are interested in for sensing application is not just this shape, this shape characterization, but this crossing points between the curves. Because the sensing measurements will be at these particular positions, and we make a differential measurement between the minus first order and the fundamental order. And this using differential measurements permits us to avoid some kind of noises, for example, uh, variations in the intensity of the light source. Also, an advantage is for low variation of refractive indices, we have a linear response of our method and a high sensitivity. 
The shape of these curves depends on the refractive indices. So by changing the refractive indices, we will change the shape of the curves. And we will see just now uh, a zoom in this zone to, com to compare at a particular refractive indices and by changing a bit the refractive index. So here it's also our uh, another optical switching effect with another grating. And at this position, we have in plane curves the minus first order and fundamental order with certain value of the refractive index. And by changing it, we have a displacement of this crossing point. But in our setup, we will not change our initial position. So we have a difference now between the energy of the minus, the minus first order and the fundamental order. So this quantity is our sensing uh, signal. So now we will talk about experimental results. We want to, we wanted to show the sensing properties of this effect and to have it simpler with a simple, uh, simple method we use to change the refractive index of our dielectric medium, a change of pressure. So at a given pressure, the atmospheric pressure with a bare gold grating at this for this, uh, for this method, for this uh, measurements, we don't have any uh, functionalized layer. We have here a photography of the setup. We have an incident light here in a vacuum chamber with different diffracted orders. And by changing the angle of incidence, we have here experimental measurements of the in black fundamental order and in red minus first order of diffraction in reflection always. And here we can see we have our crossing position nearly 55 degrees. So by changing now, by we, we put our setup in the angular position of the processing of the processing of the processing point, sorry. And now we change the pressure of our chamber. And here we have in black the difference of pressure between the initial pressure, atmospheric pressure, and the actual pressure. And in red, the different signals, the different signal between the two photodiode signal in red. So we have at this position, uh, we can see a time difference between the two. Uh, we can, ex we try to explain it by the gazing effects. And also here, a little elbow on the curves. It is more complicated to explain it. Now we can, we don't have real sure explanations of this effect. So, but here it's just, uh, pressure, the difference of pressure measurements. And with headland equations, we can plot, we can have a relation between the pressure measurements and the reflective index. And so we can plot this, which is the different signal versus the change of refractive index. And by between 70, between two times, which is nearly six seconds and 2.5 seconds, we plot this curve and we make a linear regression to have the sensitivity of our sensor which gives us a sensitivity of 866 volt by refractive index units with a correlation coefficient of 0 0.987, which is not perfect, but nearly good for first measurements. And we compute the limit of detection of lower than 10 minus five in the change of refractive index. So, now conclusion and first works what we will to do. So we have done the demonstration of this optical switching effect uh, and also this optical switching effect for sensing measurements because uh, a few years ago, uh, another application of optical switching effect in the team was made, but for measurements it's the first time we have an experimental demonstration. 
And so what's next? The measurements of the optical switching effect with functionalized layer developed by Institut Pascal with a cup of thaliacinin layer for, uh, for uh, nitro dioxide and indigo layer for ozone. And also the study of the optical responses of the sample with gases at different concentration. And uh, so a more deep study of the interaction between the gases and uh, and the functionalized layer with a plasmon. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Hugo. Um, so the uh, floor is open for questions. Um, uh, if I may, I mean, just like break. Oops, sorry. Uh, no, go ahead. I will, I will ask after. Okay, okay. So I just wanted to uh, briefly ask, I mean, like, if you have a, uh, what kind of setup would you envision to do the experiments with the gas, or if you have it already? Uh, it's a uh, setup with uh, Institut Pascal developed some uh, little chamber for gases. And with uh, its kind of... Uh, like a mini chamber okay. and uh, it is uh, put it on the table. So we we change the position. We are in uh, this configuration with the light source on a little chamber and the two dif two diffracted orders. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Please. <laughs> well, uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, I was wondering, so Basically, when you sit at the crossing of the optical switching, you can be very sensitive to the change in optical index. Yes. And, and by adding the functionalized layer, you will be sensitive to the molecular spaces, right? But by, yes. just, inc by just increasing the pressure on all of this, aren't you afraid that this will all also change um, the local optical index? And then you could have change of index with other spaces than the molecules that you're looking for. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, we, by studied a bit of the literature, it seems that we have some uh, time response of the functionalized layer to the incoming uh, species, for example, uh, NO2 or in, even in other cases. And so we think that we can't, we can we will can decouple the responses of just, uh, so for example, a uh, pressure change by adding gases in the chamber or just the response of uh, our species. Okay, so the measurement will be in the time domain. Um, yes. To, to, to sort this out. Okay, um, cool. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Um, is there uh, any other question from the audience? Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, go ahead, Florence. Oh, yes, please go. <laughs> yes, uh, I, ha I have a small question, maybe. Yes. So you, you demonstrated in, a, in a, one of your measurements that uh, you had um, a pressure influence in the, in, the, in the resonance shift, in the cross resonance sh shift. Um, uh, how... Um, so, uh, what was this the total uh, the total gas pressure? When you said the pressure, what was what, what, what was this the the pressure of your uh, analyte that you want to do to detect? Here, the it's just uh, a test without any analyte, just the uh, the air, and because uh, to have the response of just our, our to to know our sensing method. We want to first work without any gases, specific gases. So the pressure is just the pressure of air without any mm. any different gases. We okay. make the vacuum in our chamber uh, and measure what happens. Okay. So uh, when you will uh, put your uh, your analyte, yes, you will make sure that the pressure remains constant in order that it does not influence the measure. Or uh, how how will you do to 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 uh, to avoid uh, to 
to um, to separate both effect of pressure and other lights. Mm. So uh, I'm not. The Institut Pascal are very, very developed, uh, machine to do this. And they, they said that the pressure don't ch change, uh, much. And also we will work with very tiny, tiny quantities of mm -hmm. the gases. And we think that the time response of the functionalized layer by the analyte will be will allow us to uh, separate these two contributions. With pressure, we will have uh, an instantaneous contribution. And with the analyte, we have a, a time response a little slower. We think that we will be the, uh, how it will, will be, how it will work. Okay, thank you. And just maybe one last question. Uh, which concentration uh, do you aim to detect? Uh, the aim of the INA project is to con to detect very, very low concentration at, we hope at the end, with a developed uh, sensor, with a signal processing, to sense tens of PPB. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Hugo, for your answers and for your uh, nice presentation. Uh, if you can stop on sharing so that I'm the next yes. speaker can join us. So the next speaker is uh, Mathilde Prudent. Um, okay, perfect. Can you please go ahead and show and share your screen? Cool. Uh, so um, uh, the, the, the title of the, the presentation is going to be uh, Ultra Short Laser Induced Surface Structuring of Metallic Glasses Thin Films. Uh, and please, Matthew. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if you're unmuted. I cannot hear you and I cannot see you. I don't know if it's mine. Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mathilde Prudent, and I'm just starting my third year of PhD at Université Jean Monnet in the Uber Curie Laboratory. Uh, today, I'm going to present you my work about the interaction between femtosecond lasers and the metallic glasses thin films. So here you can see the presentation outline. I'm going to start with the context of my work, uh, presenting you the main goals of my PhD. After that, I'm going to present uh, the sample irradiated and also the experimental setup used for the irradiation, continuing by the main results concerning two principal aspects, the topographical effects and the structural effects. Uh, finally, we will discuss the potential applications and also the perspectives of my work. So my PhD is supported by a uh, auvergne rhone alpes region project with uh, different partners, such as IREIS of the HEF group and also the la laboratory Mateis of INSA Lyon. I am studying the interaction between femtosecond lasers and metallic glasses, in other words, uh, amorphous uh, metals. And the main goal of my PhD is to functionalize uh, some metallic glasses thin films uh, by ultra short laser pulses in order to improve um, the surface properties of the sample. Uh, this functionalization is uh, based to uh, is based on uh, two different strategies. The first one concerning uh, the creation of uh, a multi-scale surface topology and uh, the second one involving the nanocrystallization uh, and the control of the density, the location, and also the size of the different crystallites. Um, uh, by uh, controlling and improving the surface properties of the sample, we can just, um, we are targeting different uh, application fields, such as uh, biomedical fields or also uh, renewable energy fields, for example. So, um, there is a lot of work, uh, previous work that um, exposed the um, results of the inter about the interaction between 
uh, ultra short lasers and also classic metals. Uh, these classic metals uh, are um, uh, crystallized and present at the surface some roughness and some defects. And uh, here you can see some uh, types of structures that can be created after irradiation. For example, LSFL, so low spatial frequency lips, and also HSFL here, high spatial frequency lips. We can see that uh, this, uh, all of these structures present different uh, orientation regarding the um, electric field direction. And also for metals, classic metals, we have some um, irregularities and also a lot of bifurcation for these structures. It's not the case for the metallic glasses, for the buck metallic glasses. And we can see that after irradiation with ultra short lasers, we can obtain LSFL with a lot of, um, with uh, high irregular LSFL with few bifurcations. Uh, at the beginning of my PhD, we did some preliminary work um, about the interaction of uh, between femtosecond lasers and uh, bulk metallic glasses, and we brought to light the possibility to um, to create three main types of structures after irradiation. So here, LSFL, very regular LSFL grooves, and also HSFL. So now we will discuss about the interaction between femtosecond laser and uh, bulk metallic and uh, metallic glasses. Sorry, but in the thin film shape. For this, we use a metallic glass fin film manufactured by PVD at Institut Jean Lamour in Nancy. And the composition of this fin film was 65% of zirconium and 35% of copper. Here you can see that before irradiation, we can see some interstices, interstices between columns created by the PVD process. And this morphology is different that the, from the initial morphology of uh, bulk metallic glasses after polishing. However, we can see that after uh, AFM analysis, we just extracted here a profile line of roughness. And uh, we can see that we have a very low initial roughness for thin film also, less than 10 nanometers. It's approximately the same order um, in comparison to the average roughness obtained after polishing for bulk metallic glasses, this roughness was approximately three nanometers for bulk. So to uh, irradiate these uh, thin film metallic glasses, uh, we just use a direct uh, setup uh, that allow to create single pulses. In this setup, we have a half wave plate and also a polarizer that allow us to control perfectly the polarization and also the energy. We used for that a laser with a wavelength of 800 nanometers, a repetition rate of 1 kilohertz, and we fixed the, pul the pulse duration um, to 60 um, femtoseconds. We used for the test a fluence of 0 0.06 joule per centimeter square, and we just moved the number of bursts between 1 and uh, 50 bursts. So here you can see uh, the first results for the single pulses irradiation. To the left, we can see um, a zone, a zone of a non-irradiated sample before irradiation. So, and after we can see the same zone after irradiation with 50 bursts of, um, of laser. So we can see that we have the creation of nano wells in the interstices zone that we talked about before. And uh, this number of nanowells increases with the number of bursts. Um, after the, reali the realization of um, an AFM analysis, we didn't see, uh, we didn't saw any difference between the sample, uh, between the, for the roughness bet for, between the sample before irradiation and after irradiation. Just uh, some small nanometers of difference, but this, uh, this difference is not significant. For these reasons, we choose to um, realize some time analysis in order to know much, much more information um, about the nano wells and their characteristics. So here you can see the results um, of the time analysis for a non-irradiated zone. So we, for this analysis, we just extract here some um, fibrillamellar and we realize the time analysis on this fibrillamellar. 
You can see here that we have a very small roughness, a very low roughness in according, according to the AFM analysis. And we can see, uh, two, um, two sh uh, shades of color. So one color in the surface of the sample and another color in the subsurface of the, of the sample. Also, uh, this analysis uh, show us that we have a amorphous zone in all of the fib lamella. In comparison to this, um, this um, analysis, we also uh, extracted some uh, fib lamella in an irradiated zone after 50 bursts of irradiation. And we can see that here we, we have the nanowells uh, regularly disseminated in all of the fib lamella, in all of the sample. And we can see that we have uh, some closed um, nanowells and also some open nanowells. Uh, around this nanowell, we see it seems to be some uh, crystallization and also in the surface of the sample. And uh, to know much more about the repartition of the elements, we uh, realize some EDX mapping after. So here you can see the um, EDX mapping on the non-irradiated zone. Uh, we can see that here, the much more colored uh, zone uh, match with a uh, zone with a uh, high concentration of zirconium and uh, oxygen. And in all of the sample, we have the approximately the same concentration of zirconium and copper that initially. So 65% of zirconium and 35% of copper. But here we have some uh, amorphous uh, layer. It seems to be an amorphous passivation layer uh, containing a lot of zirconium and oxygen. So in the EDX mapping, we just uh, represent here the copper in red and also the oxygen in uh, green because uh, the, um, it's much more visible and also the zirconium is approximately homogeneously um, distributed in all of the uh, all of the zone. Um, we also realize some uh, EDX mapping, but now in the nanowell zone and. Uh, now you can see that uh, around the nanowells, we also have a very uh, uh, a, um, a zone uh, with a high concentration of uh, zirconium and oxygen and also in the surface of the sample. But now this zone is, is uh, crystallized and after uh, different analysis on the atomic plane here, we uh, found that we have a zirconia in monoclinic uh, structures here. Uh, we also realized this analysis, um, this edX mapping uh, on a nanowell closed zone. And we observed the same results. That, so around the nanowells, we have a zone very rich in zirconium and uh, oxygen, and also in the surface of the sample. And it's matched with the presence of the zirconia in monoclinic shape, in monoclinic surface, sorry, uh, structure. So uh, after irradiation, we seem to crystallize the sample and uh, now there is some open question. So we didn't know if we crystallize, we crystallize the sample after the oxidation or if the oxidation induced in, in, is induced by crystallization. So we try to do some temporary implementation of BIM in order to see the effects uh, on the nanowells and their characteristics. So for that, we just uh, use a double pulses uh, generated setup. And in this setup, we have uh, two half-wave plates and two polarizers in order to control perfectly the polarization and the energies in the two ways. And uh, we use also the same um, characteristic than before, the same parameter. So a wavelength for the laser of 800 nanometers, a repetition weight of 1 kilohertz, and a pulse duration of 60 femtoseconds. We fixed here the fluence at uh, uh, two, uh, 0.06 joule per centimeter square, and the number of bursts was also fixed to 50 bursts. And we uh, use um, we fluctuated the delays between uh, zero and uh, 70 picoseconds. So here you can see the the results for the irradiation um, for the different uh, delay time delays between zero and 70 picoseconds. We can see that like before we have nanowells in the sample irradiated, uh, but after we create also so H 
HSFL, some HSFL, so high spatial frequency leaps. And uh, we can see that they are much more marked for some delays. Uh, for example, here we can see starting from 2 picoseconds until 30 picoseconds, we have this uh, HSFL. And uh, visually, they are much more marked for the delay of 16 picoseconds. These time delays match also with another characteristic. In fact, here we can see the evolution of the concentration of nanowells according to the time delay between the two pulses. And uh, we can see that the highest uh, concentration per micrometer square is for uh, zero, zero picoseconds between the two pulses. Uh, but except this time delay, we have the higher concentration uh, of nanowells for 16 picoseconds. So it seems to be uh, concluded and we have um, uh, the number, the concentration of nanowells seems to match perfectly with the apparition of HSFL. So we realized also some TEM uh, analysis on some fib lamella extracted uh, from the sample uh, uh, irradiated at um, 16 picosecond delay time delays between the two pulses. And we can see here the presence of the HSFL, so a much more uh, uh, a bigger roughness than before, um, and also the presence of the nanowells. This nanowell seems to be uh, seems to appear uh, in uh, each side of the HSFL bump, and so maybe with the um, temporally implementation of um, of beam, we can just control the nanowells locations. So all of these results just like uh, show us to uh, that we can um, after femtosecond lasers on metallic glasses in thin thin uh, uh, shape that we can uh, create a double surface topology with the presence of nanowells and HSFL so high spatial frequency leaps. We can also after irradiation create some surface crystallization, and uh, with a temporal implementation of beam we can uh, control the concentration of nanowells and also their locations. All of these results seems to offer a lot of opportunities for application fields. In fact, maybe we can improve the mechanical properties by uh, stopping, for example, uh, the, some crack, crack propagations, like here. Maybe also we can modify the wettability um, so of some liquid in the surface. Uh, because of the presence of different uh, topologies, so nanowells and HSFLs. And also, uh, maybe we can uh, store some liquids inside uh, the nanowells. Uh, for some perspectives of this work, uh, we have to uh, improve the statistical analysis uh, in order to well describe the nanowells, their concentration, their location, and also all of the characteristics. We have to understand uh, more the phenomena conducted, conducting to the creation of the nanowells and also to the crystallization of the sample. And after that, we will just focus on the um, irradiation of uh, large areas with a scanner in order to characterize um, macroscopic surface properties such as the corrosion, um, biological behavior or mechanical properties. Thank you for your attention. And if you have any question, don't hesitate. Thank you very much, Mathilde. Um, and yes, indeed, I mean, like the floor is open for questions. Uh, if there is any from the audience or from the jury. Just one quick question. Um, in your two concepts, uh, you say your maximum at uh, 16 picosecond, if I remember well, but I think I saw another one uh, at time zero. Uh, yeah, ex ex uh, yeah, exactly this slide, uh, 16. Um, try 16. 16, okay. Yeah, you see at time zero, you have the highest concentration of the HFSL. So I was, I was wondering if, uh, if this means anything, or if it's just an artifact of the measurement. Uh, no, it's not an artifact. So it's not the concentration of HSFL, it's the concentration of nanowells. In fact, so the concentration of the small uh, nanowell is visible here. 
and it's not an artifact. So maybe we think, so we start with a high number of nanowells, and after with the time delays, maybe with the implementation, the temporal implementation of BIM, we can just after uh, close some nanowells with the other, uh, other bursts, and after open them again. Okay. Uh, and, and then is there a link between the, so then the HFSL and the nanowells? Like, uh, could it be, like, uh, like so more it seems, well, yeah. it seems to be some link because we can observe for uh, 16 picoseconds. So we have, except for the time delay zero, we have the highest, the higher concentration of uh, nanowells. And also here we can see that uh, in the small video that we have, um, uh, HSFL much more marked in for this uh, this time delay, and also there is some concordance because we can see after the time analysis that this uh, nanowell seems to appear uh, in some uh, location, particularly uh, at the on each side of the HSFL bump. So maybe there are uh, there is some link, but we are still investigating this question for the moment. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much for the for the answer. Um, is there a, is there any other uh, question from the audience? No. You can, I'll just remind you that you can type it in as well yeah. in the chat. Maybe just a small question. Sure, please go. Yes. Um, still on the same uh, curve that uh, Jeremy was speaking about. Um, well, I don't understand what the, those that mean physically uh, a delay of uh, zero picoseconds. Is it close to zero or what does uh, that mean? Uh, it means that it's close to zero and the two uh, uh, waves are superposed, in fact. So here we use the same polarization for the two, um, for the two different waves in the two waves here. And it's oh, okay. Understand now. We okay. So they are in phase. Yeah, you mean? The yeah, phase. they are in phase. Yeah. Okay. And uh, still on the same curve. Uh, 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 okay. So we we see that there is a little. I I, I don't know if the if uh, the, the the shape that we see is due to is reproducible or is there maybe any effect of noise? Have Have you made several measurements for each point or? Uh, not for the moment. We just uh, did this um, this statistical measurement for two uh, samples for the moment, but we have to do much more uh, analysis after. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for your question. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, and I think it, um, yeah, we move to the sorry the next um, speaker. Thank you very much, Martin, for your presentation. And the next speaker uh, is going to be uh, Don Levan. I hope that I pronounced it correctly. Please correct me if I was wrong. Yeah, it's okay. You can share. Okay. Okay. So, um, uh, the title of uh, the presentation is going to be Color Variation of Self-Organized uh, Nanoparticles. Uh, I remind you that you have uh, 20 minutes, but if you can save a few minutes for questions, um, yeah, we will be thankful. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I would like to start my presentation for today. I'm Levan Yuan from uh, Veteran Lab. Uh, and I'm working uh, in uh, Professor Natalie Group uh, in cooperation with the Institute Fresnel. And my uh, topic uh, is color variation of cell organized nanoparticle. So um, first, I, I would like to to introduce uh, about the sample that I use for the um, study and the uh, role of the uh, the the project. There are two main parts in, in my presentation. The first, is, first part is the color variation of the sample according to the laser scanning speed. And the second part is the, um, the performance of color uh, due to the cross polarizer. And um, finally, I will uh, 
I have some conclusion for my talk. So the sample I use in this study is a mesoporous film uh, of the amorphous titanium lotus with the silver nanoparticle uh, initially from two nanometer to 10 nanometer on glass substrate. Uh, we use that uh, sample under laser processing and uh, the nanoparticle will be grow and uh, cell organized in such a way as you saw in the left bottom picture. Um, the nanoparticle only, only grow and uh, organize if we can reach a uh, threshold intensity. So um, under the laser processing, um, we have uh, we have three uh, three man formation of the the the, the, the sample, which is the um, the organization of nanoparticle with the radius uh, distribution of nanoparticle and the um, the evolution of the the film. But in this study, I will I will show you that the uh, color mainly due to the the film formation. So on the left picture is the SCM uh, of the three sample. Uh, the first one is 300 micrometer per second. The second one is 1000 and the third one is 3000. And you see the evolution of the, the film, the top film titanium uh, as we increase the laser scanning speed, the technique become thinner. Actually the, the, the phase of titanium film changes uh, it's uh, from amorphous to anatite to rhodotite. Uh, it means that the refractive index become higher. But uh, you also see that the inmo inhomogeneous uh, it, it become less as we increase uh, the laser scanning speed. As you can see, it's more homogeneous and it's less as we increase the uh, laser scanning speed. So uh, the picture uh, in the middle is how I model the, the, the sample. Uh, and I, 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 I keep the refractive index of the top layer is the, the same, but the thickness is reduced as we increase the laser scanning speed. And another point is the, inter the, 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 the rise of intermediate layer, which is the, uh, the titanium particle uh, diffuse and combine with the um, silica and uh, forming the what we call intermediate layer, because the when we increase the laser scanning speed, the um, the density of the titanium film increase. That's why when I model, I increase the refractive index uh, of the intermediate layer, and uh, the the thickness also increase too. So that's the idea how how I model the the sample when we increase the uh, laser scanning speed. And I, I want to uh, remark that I keep the, the same uh, organization of the nanoparticle and the radius, just the thickness to see how it uh, control the spectral. So before showing some result, I want to show some uh, calculation uh, for, for the simulation. In our, in our sample, there are two two separate um, electric field. The first one is transmitted field due to the layer system only, which, uh, which is the e incident in reflection side and e incident in transmitted side, and the scattering field due to the nanoparticle. And to, uh, in order to calculate the transmission and reflection, uh, we have to, to take into account the extension cross-section so the attention cross-section mathematically calculated by the dot product of the scattering, scattering uh, from nanoparticle and the transmitted incident field. So it it you you can interpret this as the interference between two uh, two uh, electric field. So the physical meaning of the attention cross-section is how much energy remove due to present of the nanoparticle. And we, we can calculate the reflection and transmission based on the extension process. Actually, it, it uh, is the product of the two components. 
the first one is the multi-layer. Uh, the multi-layer just using transfer matrix method to calculate the multi-layer here, and the second part is due to the present of the nanoparticle. So this is uh, the the result of the reflectant uh, uh, experimental and simulation I, uh, I calculated. I, uh, I keep the the the, the organization either the on the top left of the 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 PowerPoint file as you saw. I uh, simulate this one hundred nanoparticle with the grating period is three hundred, and the size is uh, ninety nanometer. And I just uh, um, change the the technique as I uh, mentioned previously that the the top layer, the intermediate layer, and you see uh, the result quite agree quite well, even just the technique. So so the the there there's some some main point I want to point out here, which is the polarization sensitivity. Of the the spectral with the T and TM, I will I will discuss more in more detail about this uh, sensitivity later. And uh, you can see the the deep the big dip of the spectral shift to the left as we increase the uh, uh, scanning speed, and the color the color is more reddish. As you see in the next slide here, so I add two sample. The laser scanning speed of the five sample is, as you see here, this is uh, experimental and this is uh, for simulation. And you, you you can see the tendency that the, the big dip shift to the left and that the reflectant on the, the red dip, it, then the color become more red this as we increase the um, uh, laser scanning speed. And the, 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 um, that tendency still hold for the TM polari polarization, but the color is different because of the sensitivity that I, 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 I mentioned previously. So uh, this is the first part of the presentation. What uh, I can conclude here, we can achieve a wide range of color just simply uh, uh, there is the laser scanning speed, which is quite good, and um, and we we can understand what factor parameter control mostly control that uh, uh, output, which is the laser formation. And the second part is the polarized transmission of of the sample, which is the anisotropic property of uh, of of the sample um, caused by the cell organized of nanoparticle grating. So here the transmission in TE and TM of the experiment, experimental and simulation, you can see a huge difference between TE and TM. In this case, in uh, TE polarization, you can observe two deep, two deep and one peak. Uh, there's there may be some optical mechanism, uh, two optical mechanism coupled together, and in TM there is set a broad dip. So the the simulation result I took this is a par parameter for D one is for the laser, the, the first laser, the titanium layer, and D two is for the intermediate layer. So. So I, I, I want to show the calculation for the polarization transmission first before the result. Um, the equation is the same previously, uh, apart from uh, before taking the two electric field, I have to project to the analyzer, which is uh, with the, uh, pre 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 present at the vector A here. I have to project the uh, transmitted incident and scaring to the analyzer vector before I take the dot product to get the result of the uh, attention cross-section. And then I calculate the transmission beyond the extension cross-section. So here's the result of the polarized transmission. Uh, I put the sample sandwich between uh, one polarizer and um, analyzer. 
the first one here is uh, represent the uh, direction of polarizer and this is the direction of analyzer so the beta is the uh, angle between analyzer and polarizer you can see the the, the color here represent the the spectral due to the variation of the beta and angle of polarizer and we can achieve we can achieve the various color in in this case and the high the really distinct color when we you know when we mostly have the cross polarizer this is the indication of the phase retardation of the sample or in other words the anisotropic property of the sample so uh, so this is a uh, just a configuration of the different direction of the polarizer and analyzer uh, with the the picture is polarizer in the zero degree it's the 45 degree and 90 degree and we can achieve very different color by just simply uh, changing the angle of beta and uh, and in the case of die Echonal input polarizer input you can see it's really similar to the first cable uh, but uh, the 80 degree here is similar color with 100 uh, degree here the so all of this is uh, just the in indication of the phase variation of the sample so to understand the origin of the phase uh, variation of the sample i show you the near field in investigation uh, i have mentioned previously um, that there are three points we uh, want to uh, investigate with the, the the deep in the transmission pit and the deep another deep um which can be re uh, related to the pit and deep uh, and pit of the this is up source and cross session it's maybe not the same at the exact same wavelength due to the fact that our our sample scattering so the 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 transmission take into account the the the, the loss due to scattering but there's still a physical physically uh, mechanism still hold for uh, around that point so at the first point uh, at 440 nanometer you can see the and and uh, actually the near field it take uh, take uh, at the blue square region here with three nanoparticle here to be clear at the first in the wayland you see the the near field distribute around the nanoparticle with the indication of the localized surface plasma resonance so the first bit of absorption is due to the surface plasma resonance the second the second point here you can see the field is uh, tangentially to the grating surface and mostly on the reflection side which means that it uh, it's represent the Rayleigh anomaly and in the the SY plan you see here uh, the field distribution are passed by the grating so it's the indication of Rayleigh anomaly and the first point at the, the peak of absorption here, you see here the field distribute around this um, red square. I, I point out here, which, which, which represent the high index uh, layer, which means that the, the field distribute uh, trap into the layer, and, and we, we call it guided mode resonance because in the SY plan here you see the intensity of the localized surface resonance is really huge it means that the um, the defect this way coupled with localized surface resonance and somehow uh, it uh, it coupled with the guy uh, way guy modes of the high index layer so it it uh, it leads to the guided mode resonance So there is some point I want to 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 um, to conclude uh, about my my uh, talk. We see we can achieve a program of color just, just by uh, very the laser scanning speed and the the main factor is due to the evolution of titanium film.
And another point is the the sample the sample is a bit the phase retardation due to the formation of the nanoparticle grating, uh, and the optical um, mechanism in my sample is uh, look like surface plasma resonance and guided mode resonance. And this sample have a huge range of uh, applications such as design, display, and security. So that's about my presentation. I would like to stop now and invite the question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot for your presentation. Uh, so uh, are there any questions from the audience? Um, I remember that I remind you, sorry, uh, that you can raise your hand or uh, you can write in the, in the chat. Uh, I have maybe one small question. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, how do you explain uh, the the different colors that you obtain? Are they due to uh, more physical change, structural change, or chemical change? Where changes when you uh, change the the speed of the, the laser? So there are two uh, change in the color. I want to know that you are mentioning about the polarized transmission or the chain of the color in, the, uh, in this slide. Yes. In this slide, you, you mean in this slide? Yes, in the, so in it, the first part of the talk here. Okay. So uh, I would say that it's due to the optical property of the, the, the layer, the sample. The reason is, I just uh, uh, in in the sample I model in here is I change the the thickness, the refractive index I model, and the the, the result from simulation agree quite well with experimental. So I can can conclude that there is no chemical um, um, involved in 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 my simulation, just purely optical. Okay, thank you. No problem. Thank you very much, Ria, for your for your question. Uh, and um, I was wondering, like, how did you choose the, the parameters for your uh, simulation? If you could uh, expand on that. Uh, how did I? Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, how do you choose the parameters for your of the of the simulation? Uh, Okay, your question is how did I choose the parameter for my simulation? Yes, yes. I choose my parameter based on the SCM and TEM image of the sample. As I observe in the SCM and TEM, uh, when I increase the laser scanning speed, the formation of the titanium film changing, and um, the phase change is mean that the refractive index increase but the inhomogeneous is decreased. So it means that I can approximate the top layer with the same refractive index. And the, I, uh, from the mapping in TEM, I can see the intermediate layer arise from the um, combining of the titanium particle with the silica. So I can, can choose the refractive index increase as, I, as we increase the laser scanning speed. So for conclude, it's just based on the SEM and TM image. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your for your answer. Uh, is there any other uh, question? Uh, okay. Well then, uh, thank you for your uh, very interesting presentation, and we move to the um, following speaker, who is Thomas Labarden. Yes. Hello. Uh, you can go ahead and share your screen. Uh, yeah. Should be good. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Is it good? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Please uh, go ahead. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. So, um, hello to you all. Uh, my name is Thomas Loverdance. I'm a PhD student working uh, at CNAM University Jean Monnet. 
so my, my PhD thesis is, is part of a joint research program uh, called BXDIF in collaboration institutes and university, uh, including uh, University Jean Monnet and uh, CNAM. And today I will be speaking about metrology of appearance and more specifically about the study and simulations of speckle effects on BRDF measurements at a very high resolution. So, of course, all of these uh, terms can be a bit uh, rough when you start to, to study this subject. So, I just want to go back to the basics so that we are all on the same page regarding material appearance. So, when we, when we talk about material appearance, we need to keep two things in mind. First of all, appearance is that is something that you see. It's something that you perceive and it's quite personal. But it's also many attributes such as color, translucency, gloss, sparkle, fluorescence, and so on. So with all of these aspects, CIE uh, tried to uh, come up with a definition for appearance in 2005. So according to CIE, appearance is a visual sensation through which an object is perceived to have attributes such as size, shape, color, texture, gloss, transparency, and so on and so forth. So, with all of, with this definition, now how how do we modelize it? How do we uh, put all of these elements into one simple uh, model or one simple mathematical uh, object? So, indeed, we want to keep as many uh, as many components as possible to modelize the appearance, and the tool that we are using uh, is called the BRDF the bidirectional reflectance distribution function, uh, which is actually the ratio between the radiance and the irradiance, and it depends on the incidence light and the, reflect the reflected light, and its, a, uh, and, uh, its units is actually steroidian uh, minus one. So why do we use this particular, this particular tool? Uh, it's because we can still gather uh, a lot of information. Let, let me show you a few examples. If you have a mate, uh, a mate, uh, a mate object just like uh, these grains here, you will have a BRDF with no privileged uh, direction uh, for the reflection of the light. The the reflection will be smooth and homogeneous, and it will give an homogeneous aspect. And and as I said, we don't have any privileged direction. But as soon as we have privileged direction, then we have materials that look a bit more glossy. And this privileged direction is called the specular direction. And the shape of the BRDF, create, it creates uh, an envelope around this specular direction. And this envelope is called the specular peak that we can see uh, on, the, on, the left, on the left of, of this image. And the more the glossiest uh, material looks, the uh, highest and the sharpest will be the this specular peak, and the other attributes will almost become secondary in front of this uh, specular peak, and that's what I'm studying. That's what I want to measure, and that's uh, why uh, I'm focusing on this particular attribute that is gloss. So why do we, what do we want to do? We want to measure and understand the physical origin of gloss. So we need to measure the specular peak and we need to measure the size, the width and the shape. So the problem that we encounter really quickly is that in order to measure this specular peak, we need to achieve a very high angular resolution. Indeed, the, the visual system, the human visual system has an angular resolution of 0 0.03 degrees. So to achieve such a resolution is quite a challenge because we need to set up experimental conditions that allow us to achieve this resolution. So basically, it means that we need to collect the light within a solid angle of detection of 0 0.2 microsteroidium. Uh, and it also means that uh, it's equivalent to a collection of lights through an aperture of 0.5 millimeter at a distance of one meter from the sample, which is quite 
a small and quite a small aperture for a large distance. Which means that for a peak of 1.1 degrees large, we need to have 40,000 points of measurements, which is a lot. Thankfully, uh, thanks to uh, the thanks to CNAM, we have a device that's called Gonio Spectrophotometer Condor. Uh, it allows us to achieve such resolution. So, of course, to cover the entire BRDF in the in the entire uh, hemisphere, it takes a lot of time. This is why we focus on se se several small aspects of the BRDF. Here, the specular peak and the aspect of gloss. In order to present simply those data, uh, we, we prefer to use a flattened 2D representation of the BRDF in a Fourier plane. And this is what you have here on the right. You have this 2D representation of the BRDF. And uh, of course, this is a combination of a lot of measurements that you have here. We are going to focus in the specular peak that you can see here. We have the shape of the specular peak on the right. And this is what we are focusing on. In order to conduct this study regarding gloss and uh, the study of, the spe of this uh, specular peak, we, of course, use very glossy samples. So uh, these samples are from a gloss scale uh, using gloss units from 1 to 100 and the higher number being the glossiest symbol. So, basically, this was one of the typical specular peak measurements we could, we could have with uh, the previous device achieving resolutions just such as 0 0.4 uh, degree. Uh, shape uh, for, the, for the specular peak, and this is what we were expecting to have when we began the measurements on Condor for the specular peak. However, this is what we got. We got really strong fluctuations within the specular peak, and we couldn't see why. We couldn't uh, see why we had those huge fluctuations at first. But when we look at uh, this, um, when we look at this peak from uh, the top, here we have this image. So when we see that maybe we, you, we don't have any intuition, but as an optical engineer, we watched this image and we said, okay, maybe this is a speckle effect. So I will introduce you to what a speckle effect is, but first, why would this, why would speckle be surprising in this particular case? Well, the fact is, in this study case, we are using white light. Uh, the light source has a wide bandwidth, and speckle effect usually appears with lasers or with highly collimated, highly collimated uh, lights. So this is surprising to have speckle within the specular peak. And then, the human eye doesn't usually perceive speckle while looking at glossy samples. So why do we have speckle within the measurements? These are the questions we are asking. Are we indeed observing speckle? If, if we are, how can, how can we be sure? And if it is, how can we simulate it? Because we know speckle and we know the theory around it. So at first, we just wanted to uh, be sure that uh, those, sorry, that those uh, fluctuations weren't uh, noise from the system. So we repeated a hundred, a hundred times the measurements over, th over 36 different positions on, on our samples. And we saw that the average standard deviation for the pixel values on, in our measurements were around 2% of the overall measurement. Which, and you can see on the, on the image on the left what 2% represents. It's really small. So, well, it's really, it's really small comparing to the high fluctuations that we have. So since the, no the noise is not kind, this noisy effect doesn't come from the system, then the optical, proper, the optical hypothesis, that is speckle, 
is quite a strong hypothesis. So let's see what speckle is. So just a quick reminder, if you, lim if you eliminate a, sur a surface with incoherent light, you get a smooth surface. You don't have any fluctuations. You get a smooth color, an homogeneous sig signal. Then you eliminate the same surface, but this time with coherent light, such as a laser, for example. Then this is what you get. You get these random fluctuations. You get this random interference pattern. And this is what we call speckle. So what, where is it coming from? Actually, you take a monochromatic or a plane wave and you um, make and you throw and you uh, throw it against a rough so and you put it against a rough surface and then you see what you get. If you have a plane wave and it's polarized and uh, then you you want to see what you collect, then you see what we call a fully developed speckle where um, the intensity becomes an exponential random variable because you get a, a random optical path difference and that allows you to have this interference pattern. However, this fully developed speckle appears only if you have those particular, con those particular conditions with a plane wave, a, polari a polarized wave, if the surface doesn't have any space, spatial uh, property. But when you degrade the signal, for example, if the, if the wave plane isn't that plane, or if you have some characteristic of the surface, or maybe the optics aren't perfect, then you get a, an, a speckle that is a bit averaged. And the probability uh, law becomes a gamma law. So of course the older one is still an exponential random variable, but if you degrade the speckle, then you get this law. So why am I talking about it? It's, it's because the gamma law is actually a tool that we can use to evaluate the, the speckle and the, and the fact that if the, the idea that we have speckle or not. So now, just to uh, introduce you to uh, a, critical, uh, a critical parameter of our study, we need to look at the aperture. Indeed, the aperture of uh, Condor is directly linked to the speckle drain size. As we can see, we, we have the diameter of the aperture right here, and the speckle drain size directly depends on it. So if the diameter is larger than the speckle drain size is thinner, and then you will see that the speckle is a bit more average, and then the order of the gamma loop we just presented gets higher. So now let's look at some measurements. We have here three different measurements where you have single shot images, cross the cross section, and the histogram of the intensity values recorded in a circular area uh, in the center of the picture. Why do we look at this? Because we can see that we have the this, we have the probability distribution, and as we can see, when we increase the diameter, here we have here we have d equals four millimeters, four millimeters, then six millimeters, and then eight millimeters. We can see that the speckle grain size gets thinner, and that the order of the gamma log gets higher. So this is quite coherent with the speckle theory, but. Now, since we have those measurements and they are coherent with the speckle theory, we should be able to get those results through simulations. What's important to, rem to, to remember with simulations is that we need to take um, a, a lot of parameters into consideration, but the, prob probably the most important one is the size of the pinhole, because we need to, we need to have uh, the impact of spatial coherence. Indeed, what limits the resolution of the system isn't the capture, it isn't, it isn't the CCD, it is indeed the size of the pinhole. When we have an angular resolution of 0 0.3, uh, of 0 0.3 degree, this is what you get. So you get the smooth image that you had in the beginning. But when you increase the angular resolutions by decreasing the size of the pinhole, this 
these are what you get. So you can see that you, when you decrease the angular resolutions, you can see the speckle appear. So we need to take it into account within um, our simulations. So this, this uh, is how we simulated uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, size of the pinhole a bit wider than just a point on an axis. So at first we have uh, a point on an axis, then we shift uh, this point uh, of off axis to gain the same speckle pattern just shifted from the axis. And then we repeat this operation so to have speckle pattern side by side and to obtain a, a coherent uh, light source. So now that we have uh, achieved those simulations, let's see what we have when we uh, variate the aperture. We can see that we uh, also uh, chose to take four, six and eight millimeters to uh, have a correspondence with the measurements. And now we have the orders of the gamma law that are three, six and seven. And when we remember uh, the experiments, we have almost the same orders as before except for the last measurements, but we have a small uncertainty about the order, but we are still very close to the same order. And we can uh, say with confidence that the effect that we are seeing is indeed speckle. So what are now the next step? The next step will be first to set up a laser source. Why a laser source? It's because when you have uh, a source with a wider bandwidth, it's complicated to not have a uh, temporal coherence. So we want to be able to master the temporal coherence of the source and isolate the speckle coming only from the speckle and not from the source. Then in this, within the simulations, we want to add temporal coherence to simulate source that has a wide bandwidth in order to improve those in the simulations. This is actually ongoing work and it's almost done and I'll be able to present them quite soon. And in the end, the modelization, it, it will have an impact on modelization and definitions of BRDF itself. Because if we uh, change uh, the, the, the way we see BRDF, if BRDF, the shape of the BRDF is actually the shape of the envelope, then we have to average the speckle. So, maybe the definition of BRDF itself will be impacted by this study. So thank you very much for your attention. If you have any question, I will gladly answer. Thank you very much, Tomo, for your presentation. And uh, also indeed, I mean, if there are any questions, please go ahead. For sure, it was a fascinating talk. I, I never uh, thought about um, glow in this in this way. Uh, I have a small question. Yes, please. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you speak in your presentation. I don't remember the, the the slide number, but you you were speaking about gloss units. Uh, has the unit of of gloss? What is this unit? How do how is it measured? How do you measure the glass unit? And uh, still on the same question, uh, you you've de you have demonstrated that you, you have a pickle effect. Would this affect the the, the glass unit measurement? So okay, so the glass unit uh, is actually um, established by the by the company that we are working with. But um, it's used with uh, psychophys psychophysics uh, data. So people are looking at a couple of samples and within, with, uh, within the same uh, environment, and they just judge which of the sample is the glossy and is the glossiest. And then with this uh, comparison, we establish a gloss uh, scale. And Regarding uh, the study of uh, speckle, um, the fact is that when you have an ambient light, uh, the fact is that speckle is a lot average. So when you, so when you, um, so when you look at a glossy sample, it shouldn't, uh, the, well, speckle shouldn't affect uh, the the perception of gloss, but uh, it. 
the, the, the study of speckle can improve the, how we simulate and how we modelize uh, gloss. So the, the measurement of gloss is just by the, the human uh, eye, actually? Uh, actually, well, the measurement of gloss, uh, the, well, it's psychophysics and physics. We put in parallel the, the measurements okay. and the psycho, and the psychophysics. Okay. We, we put it in parallel and we okay. have an average observer also, and uh, it allows us to do uh, those scales. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, I, I was wondering for the separation of the speaker coming from the laser and the one coming from the sample. Yeah. Uh, do you plan to do this by using the laser light directly as a reference on the detector, or you plan to, uh, plan to do some data analysis and do maybe look at the statistics of the speakers that could be different? Actually, we plan. Uh, I that's a very interesting question. We plan to do both actually because when we look at uh, when we look at the laser directly on the on the detector. Uh, we already have a, 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 base, a, um, a basis for uh, understanding the speckle coming from the source. However, uh, we need to, um, uh, to vibrate uh, the laser in order to... The, well, we have a small um, fiber and we, edge it, we vibrate this fiber in order to um, average the speckle that's coming from the laser and then we have a reference with a mirror actually uh, and then once we have achieved uh, this reference uh, then we uh, look at also the statistics by taking uh, several position on our sample and then you know we want to average it in order to regain the shape of the, the envelope, which should be the, the, the BRDF, as it is defined today. So then you, you will kind of do some raster scan, and then average up the raster scan uh, like that. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, uh, I had maybe a general question, and it might be that it's a sleepy one. Um, would this study be useful, for example, to um, uh, to uh, design new materials or new properties of a material? I'm, I'm sorry, there was interference. I couldn't hear the question. So I was saying, could, could your study be used to um, design a, a new material or a, um, yeah. Actually, actually, the whole From study. reaction, I guess so. <laughs> yeah, actually, the whole study of material appearance and particularly the study of gloss can be, of course, used to design new material and new glossy uh, sample. But it can also be used within uh, simula simulated environments, uh, virtu virtual re reality, uh, vi visual effects, and things like that. If we are improving these um, the models to simulate uh, those things, there are there are endless possibilities within the industry. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot for the for the answer and for the presentation. So uh, thanks again. So we move to the um, to the next Thank class. You Thank you very much. Sorry. Uh, in the interest of time, we have to uh, move uh, to Vincent uh, Duvelier. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Um, can you share your screen? Yeah. Can you see it? Uh, yes, indeed. If you go in presentation, so uh, please, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, so, um, hello. My PhD thesis is about uh, predicting, being able to predict the appearance of teeth using dental materials. And now the subject of my presentation is uh, the, uh, the use of the kubel kamunk model in order to predict the reflectance and transmittance factors of dental resin composites and on the importance of analyzing the effective measuring geometry. Being able to achieve an accurate reproduction of someone's dentition is a societal challenge. As teeth are part of our face, their aesthetic is very important. This means that a dental repair must be invisible. 
Um, to, to be invisible, the dental repair must have the exact same optical properties of the neighboring teeth. And under every illumination, these optical properties include the gloss, the color, the fluorescence, the texture, and the translucency. A tooth is composed by several layers of tissues, dentin and enamel, which have different scattering and translucency properties. To reproduce these properties, dentists uh, can choose between a large variety of dental materials with different shades and viscosity properties. Now, the problem is that the dentist nowadays visually matches uh, the materials to the appearance of the teeth he needs to repair. Um, and therefore, uh, the, um, the quality of the dental repair in terms of appearance, of color, relies, depends on uh, the vision of the dentist. So uh, we would like uh, to provide a more accurate and a more automated method. Let's have a first look at uh, the dental materials. Here you can see four uh, samples of dental materials that I typically use in my work. Uh, that you can you can see them positioned over a drawdown card, and here on the sides is a white paper for reference. Uh, dental materials are known to be highly scattering uh, and weak. Uh, no, sorry, highly translucent and weakly scattering. Translucency can be uh, assessed using a laser beam. Here you can see the impact of a laser on a white paper, and here the impact of a laser on a sample of dental material positioned over a white paper. You can see the large halo here, which is characteristic of a highly translucent material. Translucency makes it difficult to predict the material's appearance because it's not something that is taken into account by the most simple optical models, like the kubelka munk model that I will tell you about. Instead, uh, these models assume the material to be highly scattering, but it's not the case here. So the objective of my work is to be able to predict a dental repair and here, I tried the kubel kabunk model and assessed its accuracy to predict the reflectance and transmittance factors of a dental material in a very simplified case where the samples are flat. So it's a very simplified study uh, within the general problem. The kubel kabunk model is a well-known model for uh, its simplicity. It considers two light fluxes, one going down and one going up inside the material. It relies on several restrictive hypotheses that the illumination is diffuse, that the medium is highly scattering, and that the light inside the medium is uh, absorbed and scattered. The absorption coefficient is denoted K, and the scattering uh, coefficient is denoted S. We can deduce these coefficients from uh, measurements. Knowing these uh, coefficients and the thickness H of a layer, the kubel kamunk model can predict the intrinsic reflectance denoted tau and the intrinsic transmittance denoted, uh, sorry, the intrinsic reflectance is denoted rho and the intrinsic transmittance denoted tau of this layer. These parameters are intrinsic to the layer because they do not take into account the light transfers occurring at the interface because of the change of optical index, uh, index between the material and uh, air. These light transfers are accounted for by the Sanderson correction, which gives the measured reflectance factor denoted R and the measured transmittance factor denoted T as a function of the intrinsic reflectance and transmittance. The parameters for the Sanderson correction uh, depend on the optical index of the material and also on the effective measuring geometry. This is why it's very important to precisely analyze the effective measuring geometry as I will uh, show you later. From an experimental point of view, we have our materials and we can measure uh, their uh, reflectance and transmittance factors. But to derive the K and S absorption and scattering coefficients of the material, we need to apply the inverse approach. This means that we apply the inverse Sanderson correction to retrieve the intrinsic reflectance and transmittance, and then apply the inverse kubel formula to retrieve the absorption and scattering coefficients. Knowing these coefficients, we can apply the direct approach to predict reflectance and transmittance factors. So we apply the kubel formula and then the Sanderson correction to retrieve uh, the predicted reflectance and transmittance factors. These transmittance and reflectance factors 
were measured using the color I7 spectrophotometer from x right The measuring geometry of this device is hemispherical directional. The illuminant is the standard D65. To measure the transmittance and reflectance of our dental materials, as we know that they are highly translucent, we used the largest illumination aperture possible of 17 millimeters and the smallest measuring aperture possible of 6 millimeters to avoid the edge loss phenomenon, which is known to occur uh, during the measurements of highly translucent materials. Uh, so now let's have a look at the effective measuring geometry. Uh, here you can see a drawing of our device uh, of hemispherical directional geometry when it's used to measure the transmittance factor of a strongly diffusing sample in the first case. So for example, a white paper. <clears throat> As the uh, sample is a strong diffuser, the detector collects the radiance from the whole integrating sphere. And therefore, the effective geometry is hemispherical directional. So it matches the geometry of the device in this case. In the second case, uh, when it's used to measure the reflectance, uh, sorry, the transmittance factor of the, a non-diffusing sample or a transparent plate, for example, uh, so the detector only sees the regions from one direction, and therefore the effective uh, measuring geometry is bidirectional. So it's different from the geometry of the device. Now in reflectance mode, it's basically the same. When in the first case we measure the reflectance factor of a strong diffuser, the detector collects the regions from the whole integrating sphere, so the effective measuring geometry is hemispherical directional. But if we measure the reflectance factor of a transparent plate or a mirror, for example, the detector only collects the regions from one direction, so the effective measuring geometry is bidirectional. So this means that the effective measuring geometry depends on the type of material that you are measuring. Now, for our dental materials, which are weekly scattering, uh, the effective measuring geometry is somewhere between uh, the two cases, uh, between the hemispherical directional and the bidirectional geometry. However, we have uh, observed that they behave much more like a glass plate than like a white sheet of paper because uh, of the high translucency. So we propose the corrected Kubelkamp model, which assumes that the effective measuring geometry is bidirectional. Remember that the Sanderson correction uh, depends on this effective measuring geometry. So it changes the parameters for the correction. So we have this corrected Kubelkamp model, but we still have the classical model, which assumes that the light at the interfaces is diffused. So uh, we will uh, try both models and assess their accuracy to predict the reflectance and transmittance factors of, dental, of a dental material. To carry out this experiment, here are the four samples that we used. These are samples of the wave medium viscosity B1 shade material from Southern Dental Industry in four different thicknesses that you can see here positioned over a drawdown card. 0.4 millimeter, 0.8 millimeter, 1 millimeter, and 1.2 millimeter. These samples were obtained by inject injecting some dental resins, some dental resin between two glass plates, which spacing uh, defined the thickness of the sample. The resin was then hardened using a blue LED light curing unit during 60 seconds. So now let me show you the workflow of uh, this experiment. We measured the reflectance and transmittance factors of our four samples. Then we need to calibrate uh, the Kubelka model. So we took the sample with thickness one millimeter and used it as a calibration sample. This means that we applied the inverse approach on the reflectance and transmittance measurements of this sample to derive the material's absorption and scattering coefficient, K and S. Knowing these coefficients, we are able to predict the reflectance and transmittance factors for the different thicknesses uh, by applying the direct approach. Uh, we do not predict the reflectance and transmittance for one millimeter because at, as the equations of the model are reciprocal, the predictions are equal to the measurements, so it's not interesting. Um, once we get these predictions, we can compare them with the measurements using the CIE Delta A2000 color distance metric. This metric gives the distance between two spectra in the LAB color space. For this color space, 
uh, uh, researchers of the dental field have carried uh, several studies which show that a prediction is acceptable if the color distance between the, the prediction and the measurement is below two units and that the perceptibility threshold is around uh, 1.3 units. So this will be our goal for this experiment. Now let me show you the results. Here you can see the measured reflectance factors for our samples with thickness 0 0.4, 0 0.8, and 1.2 millimeter. And here the red dashed curves represent the predicted reflectance factors using the classical Kubelka-Munk model, the one which does not take into account our observations on the effective measuring geometry. The color distance between the red dashed curves and the black curve is uh, written here in red. So for the sample with thickness 0.4 millimeter, you can see that the reflectance prediction is totally aberrant. The curves are totally different and uh, the color distance is much higher than two units. So this prediction is uh, wrong. For 0.8 millimeter, the prediction is better, but uh, 2.2 units is still above the threshold, the acceptability threshold of two units. So this prediction is not uh, in, is not good e uh, either. For um, for 1.2 millimeter, the color distance between the prediction and the measurement is 1.5 units. So it's below the acceptability threshold, so, but still above the perceptibility threshold. So it's not a great prediction um, too. However, when we use our corrected Kubelka model, so when we take into account our observations on the effective measuring geometry, you can see that the prediction accuracy has improved. For the sample with thickness 1.2 millimeter, the prediction is below the perceptibility threshold, so it's a good one. Same for the sample with thickness 0.8 millimeter. For the sample with thickness 0.4 millimeter, the prediction accuracy has improved drastically but it's still above uh, the acceptability threshold. So this one, this one is not great. Now let's see uh, the results for the transmittance factors. Here we can see the measured transmittance factors for our three samples. And now uh, here you can see the predictions using the classical kubelka munk model. For the sample with thickness 0.4 millimeter, uh, the prediction is again aberrant because the color distance between the prediction is, and the measurement is much higher than two units. For uh, the sample with thickness 0.8 millimeter, millimeter, sorry, the prediction is okay. It's below the perceptibility threshold, but uh, so, sorry, below the acceptability threshold of two units, but not but above the perceptibility threshold. And for the sample with thickness 1.2 millimeter it's also above uh, the perceptibility threshold. But when we use our corrected Kubelka model, you can see that all three transmittance spectra are predicted below uh, the perceptibility threshold. So overall, five out of six spectra were predicted below the perceptibility threshold using our corrected Kubelka model, which is uh, a huge improvement compared to the classical model. But now we would like to try our model, uh, our corrected model, on more different thicknesses to assess its uh, stability with respect to the thickness. As we only have four samples, our only solution to simulate bigger samples was to, th uh, to stack them together uh, while making the optical contact between the samples to simulate bigger samples. However, uh, the optical index of water is 1.3 approximately, and the optical index of our material is approximately 1.5. So we need to firstly assess the quality of this optical contact. Uh, to assess the quality of the optical contact, we stack the sample with thickness 0.4 and 0.8 millimeter together so that the total thickness of the stack is 1.2 millimeter. And then we compared its reflectance and transmittance factors uh, uh, with those of the sample with thickness 1.2 millimeter. As the thickness is the same, the measurements should also be the same. As you can see here and here, uh, for, the trans for the reflectance factor on the left and for the transmittance factor on the right, the curves overlap almost perfectly and the color distance between the two curves is very low. So we can consider that the optical contact performed with water is good enough. So now we can stack our samples together in different combinations and up to a maximum thickness of 
3.4 millimeters when we stack our four samples together and try our corrected Kubel Kalmuk model on them. Here is the result. Here you can see the color distance between the predictions and the measurements as a function of the thickness of the stack for the reflectance factors on the left and for the transmittance factor on the right. For the reflectance factors, the average prediction is two delta A units, so it's not great. And you can see that the prediction accuracy uh, forms a kind of uh, an envelope that is centered on the calibration thickness. This, so only the samples with thickness was close to the thickness of the calibration sample are accurately predicted. This means that our model is not stable uh, with respect to the thickness, at least for the, for the reflectance factors. Because for the transmittance factors, all spectra were predicted below the perceptibility threshold. So this last, this last result is, uh, is a good one, is a satisfying one. To conclude, this study illustrates how important it is to take into account the effective measuring geometry as it provides a huge increase in the prediction's accuracy. The spectral reflectances were predicted accurately only for the uh, thicknesses close to the thickness of the calibration sample. So we would like to get rid of this uh, thickness dependency. Uh, this means that we will have to implement more complex and less restrictive models, such as the four-flux model or the radiative transfer equations, because those models do not rely on so many assumptions uh, like the kubel kamen model. I thank you very much for your attention, and if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vincent. Uh, well, we, unfortunately, we have only a couple of minutes for um, for questions, but well, one minute for questions. Um, so, uh, yes, if there is anyone in the audience that would like to, to ask a question, you can raise your hand or you can uh, unmute yourself. Maybe. Just very quickly. Um, okay, so those measurements uh, and calibrations are for the artificial samples. Uh, if you want to do the measurement and then do the inverse problem at the end for application, it will be on, on the patients, I assume. Um, would this have an impact uh, on the effective geometry and the measurement geometry? Um, that's a complicated question. Uh, it should definitely have an impact uh, on the measuring geometry. I'm not sure uh, precisely how, um, because we could do some very local measurements, actually. So the topology, the shape of the patient's teeth might not have uh, such a big influence. For now, I, I can't tell you for sure, because I only uh, started my PhD recently and only studied uh, very simple cases with flat materials. So, yeah, I, I can't tell you for sure, but well, definitely it will have an influence, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so maybe uh, I um, uh, just a, a quick one on uh, on the um, uh, advancements that you were suggesting in uh, in the, that are needed uh, in in the model, uh, or mm -hmm. the use of another model. Could you briefly speculate on uh, on these? Um, yeah, uh, we think <clears throat> so. Yeah, about the four flux model and the radiative transfer equation. Yeah. We we definitely think that it will provide an improvement because the kubel kamuk model can, can only consider uh, either the collimated uh, fluxes or the diffuse fluxes. But in fact, uh, the reflectance would be more accurately predicted using the diffuse fluxes, while the transmittance would be more accurately predicted using the collimated fluxes. So a model that can take both type of fluxes into account, like the four flux model or the radiative transfer equation, uh, would definitely provide uh, huge improvements. Okay. Okay. So this is part of your perspective, I imagine. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks again for um, your presentation. Very interesting. Thank you. And we move to the uh, last uh, presenter of the day. Uh, yeah, if you could stop sharing so that uh, Alize. 
Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for staying with us uh, throughout the afternoon. Um, so if you could uh, start sharing your screen. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Uh, you can go ahead. Good. Okay. My name is Alize Bouchot. So I'm a PhD student at the LAMCOS. It's a collaboration with LGF. My work is a part of a multidisciplinary context, tribology, image analysis, and machine learning. start with the tribological approach. We have here an illustration of dry contact that is without lubrification. The two bodies in the contact are in relative displacement with a velocity v and a normal load w is applied on the contact. The tribological interface in red in the figure has a thickness of few microns we speak of third body. This third body has characteristics. Excuse me, I have some trouble. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> the... uh, I, help you I have some connection for problem with my internet connection. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. The study of the characteristics of a third body induces a multi-scale study of the structure present and the study of the third body flows in the contact. The contact has mechanical parameters such as contact pressure, as well as physico-chemical parameters such as composition of the atmosphere. The tribological parameters like uh, coefficient of friction will evolve over time. And the objective of my work is therefore to link the characteristic of third body to tribological data. So this, uh, the studies carried out uh, to date have made it possible to link the morphology of third body particle to wear mechanism or to test condition. They are always individual particles extracted from the contact by ferrography and the particle in the contact complex configurations such as uh, agglomerates or their spatial, spatial distribution are not taken in account. We propose to go further by studying the third body, its characteristic and texture property without removing it from its supports to minimize disruption to its configuration. So the question is, how do we do that? We, in, in the first time, we have to produce the third body. This requires tribological experiments during which it will be possible to make measurements in real time. Once we, these tests are completed, we'll carry out post-mortem analysis. They will be composed by the analysis of the data and the acquisition of images of the disk and pins thanks to the microscopy. It will then be necessary to process the images in order to be able to use them and logically follow the analysis phase of the images it will be a study of particle of third body, but also to of texture. And finally, I will present to you my uh, future perspective and objective of this works. We use a pine on this trigonometer. This is this mechanism. It will it will allow us to produce third body and measure certain physical parameters. We have a force sensor in red to measure tangential force. We, with it, we will be able to calculate the coefficient of friction. We have also a free axis acceler accelerometer and two cameras, one at one at inlet of the contact and at outlets. 
this uh, these cameras will uh, help us to monitor in situ the progress of of our tests the data obtained must be studied the example presented here is the evaluation of the instantaneous coefficient of friction here and is its average per lap we also can do a frequential analysis and this study could be made on uh, accelerometer data for example on the free axis the other aspect of post-mortem analysis is image acquisition using a scanning electron microscope SEM. for this different regions of interest are selected but uh, you need to know that what we observed on the, on the disk correspond to the last lap of, of the test. It's important to know that because if you search an, an event, a specific event, you look at the friction map before. If it's not on the last lap, you have difficult to uh, see it on the disk. Once the global aspect is observed, it must be interested to look at different structures of the third body located at different scales. Here it's an example of a portion of the disk located at 225 degrees. It's necessary to capture image of the edge of the track in, in pink ears, but also of uh, its center in yellow. The two types of third body will give difference to, to D and different observation. The first one is the observation of particle analysis. We look at their morphology, for example. And the second is the texture analysis. So we do image processing and image analysis. The same kind of work is poss possible on the pin, but uh, in this presentation, I will present the result of disk, of particle of a body of disk. As specified above, third body particle may present in different structure. We have a isolated particle and agglomerate. geometric and morphological characteristics it's necessary to segment the images for this we use a code developed in python this last will make it possible to perform several operations on the image if necessary of course you could apply a filter modify exposure contrast or on over um, image processing operation and after the image undergone a thresholding with the Otsu algorithm, and the image is clean, is clean up. Uh, this uh, cleaning operation is done with uh, different geodo, geodo, excuse me, geodesic operation, like a reconstruction by closing or opening. And finally, the region corresponding to segmented particles are detected. You can see it on the rectangle in the red square on the image. It may happen that the texture of particle or agglomerates does not allow segmentation by thresholding, as on this agglomerate here. If I do a thresh thresholding, that's the result. So the shadowy area will be interpreted by algorithm as all and we will lose information. So to overcome this, another code we has been developed. It used machine learning algorithm and allow better segmentation in case of complex texture. You have the result here. So we, lo we lose um, less information in this case. Particle are segmented. It is then possible to extract their characteristic. Here you have an example of size characteristic, like perimeters and area. 
and shape characteristics like circularity, elongation, but they exist the other parameters like convex area, regularity, roundness, and other. Note uh, that the characteristics of size only serve to give us a subjective indication because it's a measure on a 3D, ima uh, 3D image of an object in 3D. So the tilt of particle can change everything. This uh, 3D aspect in course is a uh, course of development. We keep this in mind, but uh, we work on this uh, for the future work. Image analysis operation will allow to characterize third body located at edge of the track. But for ones uh, at the centers, we need to use um, different tools. We need to use, uh, we need to proceed differently. It is impossible to segment, so we propose to study this its texture with these tools, the gray level co-occurrence matrix. We have here an illustration of this function of how it works. The GLCM will count the number of times a pair of pixels in terms of shade of gray is found in the image for a given distance and angle. For example, here, the distance is two and the angle is 90 degrees. We count the number of times we, we see the pair four and one in this direction. And it's contabilized in this matrix, the co-occurrence matrix. It's possible to extract after characteristics of this matrix. So like uh, entropy, contrast, homogeneity, inertia, energy on over. In our study, we are especially interested in entropy. We try to calculate it for different area of interest at different stage of the contact life, running in, end of the running in, and steady state. In the case presented here, we have two disks with different initial surface condition. We were able to note that the contact would evolve differently in both cases to find themselves in the similar situation once the stationary regime was switched. Here we see the different state of entropy at the beginning because the texture was very, very different. There is a smooth texture here for the red disk and there is a lot of particle in, on the green one. This difference can explain the difference of entropy, but entropy is just one parameter in a, a lot of quantity of parameters. So we need to enrich the descriptor of surface for a better understanding of the phenomenon and to um, to confirm our theory of the evolution of texture of third body during this test. This will give us just the first interpretation of the evolution of morphology of third body located in the center of the tracks. So if we summarize the approach, several experiments are carried out under different conditions, ranging from the change of speed or changing the atmosphere in which the mechanism is located. This gives us different conditions with different, different data. It's then necessary to analyze this data. It makes it possible to know the evolution of contact, but also to locate it where events occur, potentially accessible during the acquisition of images. The lo logical next step is the acquisition of images in the region of interest presented before, but we can also look at some de event detected during the data analysis or find over that we can try to interpret after in post-treatment. 
finally, the image analysis phase, we saw in this presentation that we use different techniques for segmentation. And for the future, it will be relevant to use a single tool for segmentation. It's why we, inter we, we start to interest two units, uh, an algorithm of deep learning used in general for medical images analysis. But uh, this property could uh, have a good application in our domain. And it's important to know to some to signify diversity of fair body structure and their complexity require us to search for new descriptor for texture, but also for morphology. Because recall that the final goal of this thesis work is to link the experimental data to special uh, to characteristic of fair body, morphological, geometrical and texture. To do this, we will use in the future machine learning, but, but we need to produce a maximum of data and enrich our list of relevant descriptors to have a better understanding happens during the contact and the contact life. If you have a question, I could repent. Thanks for your intention. Thank you very much, Alize. Um, very interesting presentation. Um, so, um, if there are, if there is any question from the from the audience, otherwise I, I might start with a with a quick one. Okay, so I go ahead and then like. Um, we hear from from others. Uh, so I was. Um, you mentioned the the problem that uh, not the problem. I mean, like the um, the fact that I mean, like it was uh, hard to take into account um, three dimensional um, uh, bodies or particles, let's say. Uh, and so I thought that I mean, like the the idea that you suggested of using uh, this new algorithm, like the unit. I mean, if I understood correctly, I mean, I think that this could really solve uh, this issue or. Not the issue for the 3D, 3D problem, but uh, for the diversity of texture of particle of agglomerate, it could solve the problem. I have an example of a problem I, I met regularly when I work on my images. The surface of disk has stridation. Mm -hmm. And when, when I segment my images, I look um, I, I can see stridation near the particle segmented, so this uh, creates a bias right. of the characteristic of particle. So I hope uh, with UNET, it, it could uh, detect only the, the particle and not the stridation. It's uh, a, a gain of time uh, from, for me from the extraction of morphological particle characteristic of time. Okay. The first 3D aspect, I don't know yet so if it has an effect, but uh, for this, it could be very interesting. Well, yeah, yeah. No, I just thought that I mean, like being uh, being used for um, for medical application, I thought that I mean, like the morphology or like the third, uh, the, the third dimension would have been easier to to be taken into account. But uh, thank you for the for the explanation. So, is there any other question? Um, yes. I Oh, sorry, I can hear you. Yes, I can try w one question. Thank you yes, please. For, for this talk. Um, <clears throat> in your conclusion, you mentioned that uh, you, you, the, the main objective right now maybe is to, uh, after image processing, is to use machine learning as, as a tool to link, uh, <laughs> sorry, image processing and, and the tribological behavior. I was wondering two things. Um, first of all, you mentioned uh, to have already used machine learning to extract particles from your images. Uh, do you plan to, to use the uh, same algorithm or uh, do, do you, do you uh, think to, to use other ones? And, and on that side, uh, my questions are, do you have an idea of the quantity of data? that uh, will be required for that and 
is it uh, something that you already plan, such as uh, think about uh, unbalanced data or uh, anomaly detection on your uh, tribological behavior? Can, can you tell us a little bit more, or is it too early? <laughs> uh, for the first uh, part of the question, I think I will use uh, the same kind of type of uh, algorithm. So I use um, MLP, multi-layer perception, for my segmentation because uh, for classification they give the good result in general but i'm not uh, i'm not close to others i i had uh, already uh, programmed a code for uh, other type of algori intelligent al algorithm so i will do um, in, in uh, um, performance tests to uh, to choose the, the final uh, my, to uh, stop my final choice so and for the quantity of data uh, i'm not uh, a rest for for how many i could uh, I, I have to collect but i know we have uh, to uh, produce many data and um, but i don't know already the, the number if i look at the so my bibliography research for the unit, for example, I know with uh, 30 particles, image of particles, I could have good results for my segmentation. But for the link between rheological data and preferred body characteristic, I'm not fixed uh, yet. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Elise. Um, I don't know if there are any other questions. Otherwise, we uh, we close the. Uh, the maybe one, maybe yes, one. Please, point. please go ahead. Sorry, I didn't uh, see you. <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, one thing I haven't understood is um, you talk uh, about you talk about uh, the coefficient of, of friction measurement. How do you think, yes. he, or maybe I don't know if you have used it to extract some uh, of your uh, tribology parameters, but and if if yes, how does it helps you to get those parameters? Uh, I I'm not sure I have understood the question. Um, plot my uh, coefficient of friction here. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't understand what you want to know about this. this. Uh, do, does it help you to get uh, some information about the the um, uh, tri tribological parameters? Some or some of the tri tribological parameters? Coefficient of friction is yes. the tribological parameters. Ah, it is a tribological. Yes, yes it's my uh, main. Uh, parameters so i would like to link is the variation or is value with the um, morphology of um, third body so if i look uh, here i have um, a low coefficient and mm -hmm. i would like to know if it exists a correlation with the shape or with okay the understand so you want to to link the the shapes of the, the third bodies to this uh to these uh, graphs. To yes, this, uh, but not also with um, not only with uh, friction coefficient, with uh, accelerometer, for example, and in the future maybe with um, a measure of a um, micro, because uh, this test um, uh, we see we are uh, noisy, and uh, the, the noise produced during this test could uh, impo uh, give us uh, information. Uh, to link with uh, morphological, with uh, accelerometer and friction coefficient. Okay. And the, the vibration also could uh, induce uh, um, characteristic of uh, shape of the particle. If there is many vibration, maybe the configuration will be different when uh, I don't have vibration. Okay, understand now. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot, Alizé, for the for your answers and for your presentation. Uh, so we, um, I think we conclude here the uh, this uh, PhD session. Uh, thank you very much for everyone uh, for the to the to the PhD students who gave us uh, their presentation and for to to uh, everyone else who stayed with us uh, throughout the the afternoon. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the, the session. We really listened to a brilliant presentation, so uh, it was great. Thank you. Uh, Ferenc, I don't know if you have any concluding remarks. Just a concluding remark. Thanks to all for being there uh, late. We only have four minutes uh, late, late, later than the scheduled program, so uh, we will close the session and the day. And uh, remember, we will start tomorrow morning at nine.